sister-in-law freaks out because she feels my boyfriend and I are denying her child food. My boyfriend's family came to town for a week and stayed with us. We made sure to have clean towels, fresh sheets, a stock fridge, etc. Unfortunately, two days after they got here, my boyfriend got laid off. Ever since then, he's been really down in the dumps and grumpy. My boyfriend's family doesn't have the best manners. They leave dirty plates behind, don't clean up after their kids' messes and such. I tried my best to ignore it and just clean up after them when they weren't home. Today, during lunch, we serve lasagna. After we finished eating, my boyfriend's sister got up and started packing lasagna for her kids to have for dinner. She packed what her kids left over and was adding more on top. They weren't going to be spending the night with us, so she wanted to have a quick and easy dinner ready for them. I told my boyfriend that if there wasn't enough lasagna left, I can order him dinner and to not worry. My boyfriend got up and asked his sister how much she was taking because he wanted to make sure that him and I also have enough food for dinner. Again, he's been very stressed about money since getting laid off. I mean, that is understandable. She screamed at him. How dare you deny food for my child? And picked her things up and left. Everything escalated out of nowhere. She packed her things and went to another rental. She felt like we were denying her child of food. I began crying and ran to my room because, unfortunately, I don't do well in these types of situations. I grew up around an emotionally abusive family and these events are really triggering for me. She told my boyfriend that she did not feel welcome and she felt like we were being rude to her. So am I at fault for making her feel unwelcome or is she just an entitled parent? She said that I was super rude for making that initial comment in the first place. The one where I told my boyfriend to not worry if we do not have enough food left. A simple conclusion for me here is that your boyfriend's family simply sucks. I don't think I need to say anything else other than that. Am I missing any details, sir? You guys let me know in the comments down below. For me, that is the conclusion. There's nothing more to say. We can get into the, the you know, like we can nitpick through the story, but we don't need to. It's just, she's a joke of a woman. Simple as that. And that is going to do it for this one. Parents brought screeching baby to Five Nights at Freddy's. This happened a few hours ago and I'm still fuming. I went to see Five Nights at Freddy's last night since it was sold out on Friday and at every theater by me during the daytime. I found a theater by me that was showing Five Nights at Freddy's well until 11 p.m. So I figured it would be dead. It wasn't really, but still. Okay, 9.40 p.m. it was. The time where tiny children should be asleep, right? No. Everyone is sitting down, and when the movie starts, the theater goes quiet. Till the murmurs of a baby can be heard. A kid around seven comes in, then a dad, then a screeching baby and a mum. They came in right as the movie started and were loud the entire time. Now, this kid didn't cry at the jump scares. Instead, it kept making sounds for the entire run of the freaking movie, and I mean louder than movie sounds. The people around me were so angry and kept shushing the kid as it waddled and ran up and down the aisle they were in. The parents acted as if we were crazy and kept ignoring their whining, screaming baby as if it would just go away. People would leave, complain, and when movie people came in, we saw hope that they'd be asked to leave. But instead, they just looked around for the ear bleed demon and then effed off as if they couldn't locate the screeches. At that point, the kid said, Mama, goo goo gaga. It's like the kid is right freaking there. The mum took the kid out for like five minutes and then came back in loudly and said, Mama really wants to see the movie. She put the kid on the ground and let it continue to run around. The father just ignored the kid. The older child seemed unbothered, like I didn't hear a peep from that kid the entire time. The crotch goblin would go quiet for about 10 seconds, enough time for some hope, and then continue to run around, semi-sleep on the chairs, that annoying thing that bored kids do, and just be a freaking menace to the theatre. And you could feel the vibe in there. We're not scared, we're all irate. At least I know my row was since they were right ahead of us, so the screeching wasn't even muffled. It was like eardrum destruction. Then, right as the movie ended, and I mean the first credits came on, even before the pot lights turned back off, they were freaking gone. Now they leave? The heck? And it just angers me so much, because screw the parents and screw the theatre for allowing this BS. We all pay insane amounts of money just to see a movie. I've waited so freaking long for Five Nights at Freddy's and just wanted one nice evening out. And these families come in and the theater people see the babies and say nothing. Oh, you're going to take your one-year-old into The Conjuring too? Yeah, that also happened to me. Yeah, I see nothing wrong with that. In my opinion, theater should be for 7+. Because at 7 years old, you should be old enough to just be quiet. 
Now, I don't really hate the babies, even though I dislike kids, because they're too young to understand what be quiet means or what sit still means, but come on. Nobody deserves to have their movie ruined by kids. To have kids cry all throughout the beginning of Endgame because Thanos got his stupid head chopped off, or for kids to screech because the Emperor is scary, boo freaking who, he was on screen for 0.2 seconds and then it was over. Or for kids to ask, who is Batman? A million freaking times. PG-13 or 14A should still mean something. It should mean if your kid ain't 13, they aren't getting freaking in. They don't get to get in and scream and cry throughout a movie. That's the point of most kids' movies is that scary stuff is limited. And I had this happen when I was a kid and my grandparents took me to see Pirates of the Caribbean and Davy Jones scared the frick out of me. But you know what they did? They took me home. They didn't let me scream and cry during the whole movie and ruin everyone else's days. They understood that I was too young and they took me home. It's not that hard. And I get it. If you don't have a sitter, that sucks. But why would you want to punish everyone else? Well, first of all, I've got to say that is an absolute disgrace. And I'm very sorry to you that your entire experience was ruined by these entitled parents. Secondly, you simply have to get a refund. Demand a refund. That is that is the least thing you should be doing. The whole thing has been ruined. You've not got the service you've paid for. You are owed a refund. And thirdly, thank you for saying what you did about it not being the kid's fault at all. I completely agree and it's something that I do say in a lot of these episodes, a lot of my content. A lot of the time when children are, you know, young, let's say below the age of seven, I think seven is actually a very reasonable age that you've suggested here in which a child should have some common sense and should know when to be quiet, etc, etc. Especially when they're a baby like this, it's not their fault that they're making noise. You know, they're not really in control of their actions. The baby is probably extremely bored and is like, why am I watching this movie that I have no interest in? And yeah, as you've said, the fault completely lies with these entitled parents and their own ignorance. And again, yeah, you're right. Like, it's not ideal to have to get a babysitter, but that is part of being a parent. If you want to go and enjoy an adult thing and you have children, you have young children, they can't come with you, obviously. It's not only going to ruin the entire experience for you, by the way. I mean, I don't know how these guys have enjoyed the movie. Surely they haven't. But it's also going to ruin it for everyone else in the theatre. So shame on these entitled parents. And also, shame on the staff. They should have kicked them out. I'm sorry, they really should have done. Now, our second entitled parent story of this episode is actually an update to one that I read the other day. My mother-in-law photoshopped my husband's nose on our wedding pictures. Now, if you haven't yet heard that story, I will leave a link to that episode down below. Go and watch or listen to that one first, whatever platform you're on. You need to listen to that for this to make sense. I know a lot of you will have done already, but it's a really original, very good story. I'd recommend you listen to that first. Anyway, here is the update to that one. Hey dudes, I'm back. Thank you to everyone who took the time to offer me advice on my last post. Guys, if you don't remember what happened, OP was pretty much asking what on earth they should do when they found out that their mother-in-law had photoshopped her husband's nose in their wedding pictures. Absolutely insane, but uh, hey, here we go. First of all, I want to clarify that not telling my husband what his mother did was never an option. She wouldn't remove the pictures from her house unless I either told him or threatened her. Had I done the latter, she could use that against me in the future or even imply that I agreed with her. Plus, he was bound to find out at some point and I knew it would be better if it came from me. I asked how to do it, not whether I should. So I sat him down last Saturday and I broke the news. I explained what the pictures were and my mother-in-law's excuses for them. I also showed him the text that she'd sent me since my visit. The whole conversation, I was calm and straightforward, but made it very clear that not only did my mother-in-law's actions completely disgust me, but I never agreed with her about his appearance. He's the most gorgeous man I've ever met, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with his nose. I also made sure to point out that the Photoshop nose made him look like front-facing Phineas from Phineas and Ferb and my mother-in-law needs to get her eyes checked if she really thought it looked good. I thought the news would hurt him, and I was right. He didn't cry or anything, but I could see it in his face. The odd but common combination of disappointment and acceptance. He knew his mother wouldn't change, but he still had some hope. It was almost heartbreaking to watch. But for the first time in a while, he seemed to believe me when I said his nose was normal. He told me that now that he knew just how ridiculous his mum was willing to be, her opinion meant a lot less to him. So even though he's hurt, 
He feels stronger than ever. As many of you suggested, I told him that he was free to approach the situation however he pleased, but I don't want to be around his mother anymore. Most importantly, I don't want her around our son or any other kids we might have, not only because of the guilt tripping tantrums that have become her standard behavior, but also because of the way she treats the people that she's supposed to love. I know she loves her family, but I doubt she knows how love works. If she's willing to treat her sons like this, I fully expect her to be even worse to her grandchildren. In the end, my husband and I decided we're going very low contact with his mum until the holidays. Some of his relatives are throwing a party the week before Christmas and she will be there. We thought about skipping it, but he has cousins he hasn't seen in years coming for the party. He's been looking forward to seeing them for months and it doesn't feel fair to let my mother-in-law ruin his excitement. After the holidays, we'll decide how to proceed. Regardless, she won't be allowed to see our son at the hospital when he's born. And once we bring him home, she won't be left alone with the baby. It doesn't matter how much she tries to improve. That is not something we are willing to budge on. In spite of everything, my husband doesn't want to cut ties with his mother, and I understand that. Even if he wanted to, he can't go fully no contact without cutting off the rest of his maternal family as well, which he is firmly against. What works best for now is to treat her like Domino's Pizza. She exists, and that's fine, but we're not getting involved until she actually improves. So let me get this straight. You want to order your mother-in-law every single night and become grossly overweight? Or have I misunderstood that? Anyway, getting back to the story, I also decided to tell some of my own family about this. And everyone I've talked to agrees that my mother-in-law went over the line. My father is a narcissist who I'm mostly low contact with due to his entitled behavior. Most recently, he tried to make me disinvite his ex from my wedding so that he could bring his mistress. And even he was offended on my husband's behalf. And if even my mediocre respect your elder's father thinks your children are right about you being a jerk, you've probably gone too far. We talked to my brother-in-law and he's the one who informed his mum of our decision. She didn't take the news well. She's now trying to call both me and my husband and keeps texting apologies and promises to take the pictures down. We're ignoring her. My brother-in-law visited her yesterday and apparently the pictures are gone. She believed that was enough for us to forgive her, but he clarified that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Before anyone calls us dramatic, this isn't just about the Photoshop. This is about the damage she's caused in both her son's lives. I was abused in a similar fashion in my teens by my dad's ex, and I refuse to allow my child to grow up believing he's anything less than beautiful. Same goes for my husband. That's all. Again, thank you guys. Well, there we go. That is the conclusion to that story. I can't exactly remember what, what my advice was to OP, but I do believe it was along the same sort of lines as, as what she ended up doing. Just you have to tell your husband and, and let him react to it. There's no way of kind of, I don't know, being nice about it or being gentle. You just got to be brutal and say, look, this is what's happened. I'm so sorry, but this is the truth. This is your mum. This is what she's like as a person. You know, what more can I do? And ultimately, it's up to him how he deals with it and up to you guys how you deal with it. And your brother-in-law as well, who's sadly, you know, had, had some very similar treatment in his life, it seems. And I completely agree with your conclusion. No, if that's me, I don't want this woman in my life and I definitely don't want her in my kids' lives. Just a terrible, terrible person. Once again, if you haven't yet heard the first part of this, link to that is down below. That gives the context for this entire story. But um, yeah, really good solution. And I'm happy that OP took the advice of amazing people like me. Wasn't what I was going to say, but it's really what I mean. I do think as well, though, in all seriousness, that's what you guys were saying in the comments on that original episode. So good stuff. Us and Reddit helped out. Let's carry on. Now for our third entitled parent story. My parents' small business is being review bombed because I stood up to a child abuser. My parents have owned a small Chinese restaurant for the past 25 years. Recently, I spent a day working there as a waiter and a big party of 11 people came in with their children. Their children were pretty rowdy and running around on top of our benches. I politely asked the parents to calm their children down as they were causing a disturbance and could hurt themselves. The parents made a half-hearted attempt to calm them down, but the children returned to running around on the benches. Unfortunately, one of their kids fell and hit his head. The child was stunned, holding his head, and looked like he was in massive pain. Others came to his care as well as his mother, but the father told his child to get over it and to suck it up when the child started crying. 
all while he attempted to rush out the door. He didn't even try to look after his kid when he got hurt. I watched all of this silently until the father was pushing his kid to get out of the restaurant. At that point, I had enough and told the father he could try being more empathetic to his child. He told me to mind my own business and I continued to repeat how his child had just hurt himself and that he needed attention rather than neglect. The father just kept repeating, mind your own business, as his friends and family were holding him back from approaching me. I was behind the front counter the whole time. I spoke sternly and never swore. I tried to be as professional as I could while trying to make my point. Now they're review bombing my parents' restaurant and I can't help but think it was all my fault. I've tried responding as the business with context, but they keep deleting their review whenever I respond and they keep writing new ones saying that I deleted their reviews. Is there anything I can do to prevent review bombing? I don't want my parents to suffer because of my actions. Thank you for any responses. Now here is the context that I replied with for their reviews. So in quotation marks, some context. This customer's child fell and hit his head. He was stunned and was holding his head. He looked like he was in a lot of pain. The father's response was to tell his child to get over it, suck it up and to rush out of the door because he wanted to go home all while the child was not responding to him and others were coming to his care instead of his own parents. The mother did rush over. Our waiter asked the father to be more empathetic to his child who had just hurt themselves in a confrontational but in no way physical or aggressive manner. Yes, our waiter did become confrontational but in no way was he physical or aggressive to the customer. Our waiter stood behind the counter at all times and didn't swear. He spoke sternly to the man asking him to be more empathetic to his child. The man in turn had to be held back by his friends and family from approaching our waiter. The customers were also previously warned by our waiter not to let their kids run around on top of our benches as it could be dangerous. The parents made an attempt to tell them to stop, but sometime later, the children were back to playing on the benches and one unfortunately hurt himself. Now then, this I think is actually, like, I think this is a really, really tough spot. What do you do here? I think there's just, there's just like so much that we need to unpack off the rip. First of all, I, I don't actually like quite a bit of the word. Well, I mean, the word confrontational, I just don't think you should put that in, in your review or in your context reply to the review. It's just not ideal, I don't think. Nor do I think as well that you should ever really admit that a child has been hurt in your in your restaurant. I think, you know, instead of saying confrontational, you could say something instead that was just you know you were verbally direct or uh, co confrontation always has negative consequences right it sounds aggressive i wouldn't do that and yeah i just don't think that even with context you should ever say that a child has hurt themselves in your establishment but apart from that i mean i don't really know what you can do if someone is review bombing you this this, this can't be an uncommon thing right it, this must happen in places I don't know what really you can do other than say that, look, you know, this has been a, a successful restaurant for, you know, a, a quarter of, of a century. You have lots of other positive reviews, I hope. Ideally, these, you know, a small amount of negative reviews won't drown out the, the, the whole host of positive reviews and kind of, you know, feedback and love that there is for the restaurant that there has been over the past 25 years. I don't know. Like, I don't know if you guys are in the restaurant business or just in in sort of, you know, you know, have a shop or work in a shop or, or deal with kind of negative reviews like this or review bobbing in the past. What do you do? Like, is there something you can actually do? Can you can you ban someone or block uh, an IP from posting reviews of your establishment? Can you report it to the website on what, TripAdvisor or Trustpilot, wherever it is? I actually don't know. I don't know. Karen demands I drive 24 seven to bring water to their rental house. I own a hot tub repair and maintenance company. And one of the services we offer is hot tub water refills, where we truck in the water to fill the tub if the well at the house can't produce enough or if there is a requirement. One of the wells at a home I service went dry. This happens and it has a backup 500 gallon cistern. So the property manager asked if I could fill their tank. I said, yep, no problem. By the way, the well does still produce water. It's just not as much as needed. So usually if you can augment the tank, then the well will recover and you're good. At the time, my truck was in the shop. So I borrowed my parents SUV, hooked up my water trailer, filled up the tank, then transported it to their house. I would have normally declined, but the property manager was desperate and I'm the only company in town with water transport equipment. The house is then all good to go. And the Karen of this story, who is renting that property, is set to arrive that evening. Just a day and a half later, the house has run out. The property manager called me and asked if there was anything I could do if I could just take a look. 
It's Sunday, the bulk water fill location is closed, and I had no truck or ability to tow. For what it's worth, the property manager offered a new house for them to stay at, but the entitled parents didn't want a different house. So I took a small load of water over with my 1958 Jeep. I filled my small tank and trailer at my house and brought over 275 gallons. This was a total pain in the bar. Once I arrived, the entitled grandmothers come out and immediately start asking why I didn't bring 500 gallons and when I'm gonna go and get them some more because apparently they had 18 people staying there and they all needed showers. It's a pretty big mountain house. She told me that they expect me to drive round the clock delivering water for their entire stay. By the way, when I can't fill at the bulk station and I can't use my full-size trailer, this is all a total pain in the butt. It takes 40 minutes to fill the tank at my house, 20 minutes to drive, and then 40 minutes to transfer. 18 people consume a ton of water. For reference, if I had my truck and full-size trailer, the whole process would only take 30 minutes. This was all because they wanted to stay in this house to have their ideal vacation, and any other house or houses would simply not do. You know what? I feel like that's kind of fair enough. I don't normally agree with entitled people, but if you've paid to vacation in a certain house, you do deserve to be in that house. I think that's okay. So what an entitled grandma, the current of the story, then said it was my job to supply them with everything they needed for their vacation. Otherwise, she would make sure I got fired. Okay, now that I'm less okay with. I've been pretty friendly to this point. Karen said I should ensure my schedule was clear for the next week to support them and that I should go and rent a truck to be able to haul water to them. I honestly couldn't believe it. I was being a professional and friendly person who was just trying to help out, but after those remarks, I couldn't take it. So I clarified with the two mother hens about what I was and wasn't going to do. Also, their adult kids were looking pretty ashamed at this point. One, I said that that was not happening as I do not work for the management company. I'm a third party contractor who works on hot tubs. I was doing the property manager a favor by helping them out. The two entitled grandmothers then threatened to tell the property management company to cancel my contract if I don't help them and implied that as someone delivering water for a business, I'd need the money. And two, I told them to go ahead. My full-time job is in cloud technology and this is a side business for me. I literally couldn't care less and I was still not going to drive round the clock to do that when they could just move to another property. There was some more back and forth, but I finally told them that they'd be stupid to try and stay here, that their experience they wanted to have in this house just wasn't going to happen. I went home, had a couple of beers, and enjoyed the rest of my Sunday. Apparently the next morning, they did move to another house. Also, the property manager gave them a full refund, so their trip was free. Okay, and there we go for story number one. Now again, as I said, off the rip and and during that story it is tough you pay a lot of money for your perfect vacation spot and you want it to be perfect and when it isn't and something's gone wrong like this i get it you're gonna be annoyed and genuinely i would also be annoyed right i wouldn't go to the extent that these guys have gone to obviously and you can see their kids cringing at how entitled their parents are being but i can't have any qualms with the fact that they're annoyed They don't have water supplied to the house they paid a lot of money for, I presume, and they have 18 people in and it's probably like a nice family holiday. Yeah, it's going to be annoying. However, if the property manager is being so nice and offering you another house for free, then I'm sorry, but you have to take that. You really do. I mean, that's a good deal. It really is. Like the property manager probably does have to do that. They do have to offer you some sort of compensation, I presume. But this seems like a pretty, pretty good deal. Ultimately, yes, it's not the holiday, not the vacation you would have wanted, but you are then getting a free property for the amount of time you were going to have to pay probably a lot of money for. I don't know. I think it's I think it's a pretty good deal. And again, you can still be annoyed. But these things do happen. It's not as if it was malicious or if somebody just turned the water off or there was something wrong with the property beforehand and they still accepted your your reservation. No, stuff happens and you're getting a free vacation. You've got to take that. Don't ask somebody to work on Sundays and, and you know, bring water to you 24-7 just because there's an issue with the property itself. That's ridiculous. Now, moving on to our second entitled people story of this episode. Now, this one is actually from the same user as the first. 12 entitled people in an Airbnb designed for six cost me $600. I thought you might enjoy my second thirsty female dog story. I posted previously here about a client of mine with a similar story, 
But this is the origin story that happened years before that other post, the one we just looked at. My wife and I own a mountain cabin, and a few years ago, we decided to put it up on Airbnb. The place is a remote A-frame on three acres of forested land with awesome views, about 30 minutes from a ski resort. This was our first Airbnb, so we were pretty cautious with everything, i.e. looking at guests' past reviews, asking them about their trip to make sure this place would suit them, etc. Everything was going pretty well, until the entitled people of this story booked the whole weekend for Thanksgiving. They told us they were driving out from Texas. Mum, dad, three little kids, and two dogs. Being that this was our first holiday rental, we went all out for them. We set a turkey to defrost in the fridge for them and left out a snack platter and a couple of bottles of champagne. Talk about hospitality, that is unreal. They arrive Sunday nights and the next few days, all hell breaks loose. I get a 6 a.m. call on Monday morning. The whole family is puking and sick as hell. They all had altitude sickness. The cabin is at 11,000 feet above sea level, so this happens, especially when you aren't in shape and just came from sea level. I did warn the guests about this ahead of time. So I'm on the phone talking them through everything, where the urgent care is, what to do, etc. And by day two, things have calmed down. That's Tuesday. However, then I take a look at our water system gauge, remote monitored. This house has what we call a slow well recovery system. Basically, at some times of the year, the well might only produce around 60 gallons per day instead of the usual 300 plus. So we have a 500 gallon water storage system that helps smooth out the demand curves. Basically, once the tank goes below 40%, the well starts pumping. And if the well goes dry, a timer gets started and it will pump again in three hours until the tank is topped up. Full description in listing and guidebook. This system is more than adequate for six guests. Also, the house only has one bathroom and a 40 gallon hot water tank, so it's not like anyone can take long showers. Again, that's all in the listing. It's a rustic place. Tactically speaking, we just ask guests to conserve water, but the system is fully automatic and no one even knows it's there. Well, after 48 hours, I checked our tank monitor and see it's around 35% full, which means the guests used all of the storage and what the well can produce in two days. I'm estimating nearly 700 gallons of water. I literally thought something must be broken because there was no way in heck that two parents and three little kids used that much. Like perhaps the well fuse popped and they got nothing from the well. So I'm now freaking out, thinking this nice family is gonna be out of water on Thanksgiving. I called her and politely asked that they conserve water and had them reset the system, AKA turn the breaker on and off. So I basically said I'd monitor it for three hours and if I didn't see the levels make progress, I'd get a water trucked in. This would literally be a first as I've never needed to do it. Her response was, sounds good, but hurry because we drink a lot of water. How weird of a comment is that? As if five people drinking a gallon a day maximum somehow equates to the hundreds of gallons missing from the system. That honestly guys is one of the strangest things that I've ever heard. Sounds good, but hurry because we drink a lot of water. What? Well, there is really no change in water level after three hours, so I get on the phone to book a water truck. And as it's now one day before Thanksgiving, it's just not happening. So I now need to figure out how to transport water to this house. I live one and a half hours away. I went to Farm and Tractor Supply and bought a 275 gallon tank that would fit in my truck, plus hoses and pumps. Then drive up there, figure out where I can buy bulk water from, and go to the house. I finally get there at around 4 p.m. and the guests are out, but gave me permission to go inside and test things out. AKA, I wanted to make sure the system was working. It was, so they really had used that much. I went inside and found two huskies in a crate who had pooped themselves and it was all over the place. It smelled gross. The owners said they'd be back and would clean it up. At this point, I've been working on this for eight hours. I'm sick, it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and I'm now hooking up the transfer pump. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and I still need to get to my parents' house. Thankfully, it's only 30 minutes from the cabin. I start pumping, then I see their car pull up, and they are waiting at the bottom of the driveway. Knowing they have small kids, I go down and say hi, and let them know they can go on in, and I'll be done in about 40 minutes. They started to act really odd at this point, but go ahead in. Then I saw two more cars on the side of the road around the switchback big steep s bend in front of the house and it clicks the reason i just did all of this work and spent nearly 600 dollars on supplies is because these people had 12 p 
people staying there. If you're all curious as to how I didn't notice when I went inside, I didn't snoop around. I just went straight to the breaker box and then went to the crawl space where the tanks are. Also, the smell from the dogs was just horrid, so I got out as fast as possible. At this point, I went up to the front door, knocked, and said, Be honest with me. How many people do you have staying here? Um, nine? I could see she was lying. But even that number was over our legal capacity base on our permit. You realize that this listing is for six people? Well, there are beds for more people, and the kids have a crib, and we didn't know our family wanted to come when we booked it. The loft does have a pull-out couch, so best case there is sleeping for eight adults, but I'm guessing people were sleeping on the couches as well. I just spent $600 plus a full day to solve a problem that was actually not a problem, I said. Well, the house should have water. No, the house system was designed and tested for six people. The stated number on the listing I don't know how you think it's okay to have this many people here. Look, we could leave, but it would have to be tomorrow. And we expect a refund because we don't want to drive down these roads in the dark with our kids. It's maybe 6 p.m. at this point. There's no cell service at the cabin. So I went into town and got on the Wi-Fi at a local bar and called Airbnb. At this point, I've been hosting for three months and I had no idea how to handle this situation. But now I was more afraid that they damaged something in the house. So Airbnb canceled their reservation and asked them to leave. I was able to recover around $200 for a deep cleaning on the house and they didn't get a refund. On a funny note, at the beginning of this year, I started a hot tub service company and water trucking is a service we offer. And I used some of that equipment to get started. Oh wow, that is interesting and it kind of makes sense now. And there we go. That is the end of the second story on that one. I've got to say, you know, it's one of those. It's kind of glamorized, I think, in my head. And I don't know if you guys have seen the adverts in whatever country that you live in. But here in the UK, the adverts for Airbnb are now targeted at people that, that are homeowners. And when they go away on holiday, for example, the advert is targeted at them saying, if you're away, why don't you also run out your house for a little period of time, you know, just like a week or so, or even a weekend on Airbnb. So you're making money from your property when you're spending money on another property when you're on vacation or whatever. However, although it is kind of glamorized, seeing stuff like this, I just don't know how I could ever risk that. Sure, um, you can make good money from doing it, but ultimately, if there's a risk of people like this being in your home, then no amount of money would ever warrant that stress and potential disaster that, that we've just seen has happened in this one so yeah it sounds great and all i just don't think i could ever do it guys if you've ever put your property on airbnb and rented it out get in the comments down below have you ever had any terrible renters like these people or has it been pretty seamless and, and easy and you've you've made decent money from it i'm genuinely quite interested because it's something that i would have considered in the past but hearing horror stories like this i'm just not sure now if i ever could karen gets shut down at a funeral my mum died in 2011 right around the time that my paternal aunt cookie was left by her husband after beating cancer for a third time now my aunt is very physically changed from all the chemo and radiation she had gained a lot of weight, lost most of her hair, and had aged a bit faster due to a lack of hormones from having every trace of womanhood cut from her body. I have extreme anxiety, stemming from agoraphobia. So my aunt Cookie was my safe place for the duration of the whole event, which lasted several days. This consisted of everyone being at my parents' summer house in Mexico, basically standing around, chatting, drinking, and eating everything in sight. This funeral had every family member, plus people who were aunts and uncles that I'd never met in my life. Not being a drinker and not knowing a lot of the people walking around, my aunt and I sat down to have a cigarette each and catch up on our lives and whatnot. Suddenly, while we're mid-sentence in her cancer update, a Karen that I'd never set eyes on in my life starts loudly going, ugh. She swats at the air like our cigarette smoke is even anywhere near her and makes a big fuss. Karen says, Oh, that is so disgusting. How can you behave in such a disgusting manner at a funeral? I reply, My mum was a smoker, so she'd approve. What? She was your mother? She didn't teach her daughter how to be a lady, I see. And you, talking to my aunt, you should know better. What do you have to say for yourself? Smoking in front of this child. I was 33 years old. My aunt Cookie takes off her sad cancer hat and strokes the small tuft of hair she had left in the front 
and booming her voice but not yelling, says, for all to hear, what's it gonna do? Give me cancer? Karen looked uncomfortable after the hat came off, but still managed to look insulted and walked away. I could hear the internal re here. After a millisecond of silence, I giggle snorted and laughed until my sides hurt. Everyone else in the room just kind of smiled, though I think I heard a few snickers. I asked my aunt, who was she? My aunt said, I don't know, some weirdo that probably came for the free food. My aunt rocks. She's been in remission since 2012. Oh man, there we go. What a way to start an episode. Your aunt is an absolute beast. I'm sorry. Imagine the look on this Karen's face as she takes off her hat and just goes, so what? I don't care. I've beaten cancer three times. It's amazing, by the way, that she's been in remission since 2012, that she's still going on. I mean, like, fair play. The strength, the, the patience, I don't know, just, just the courage to continue to go through that. Chemo after chemo, probably most likely, but yeah, it, it will go well and, and she'd be okay now. It's pretty crazy, so fair play to her. And as for this Karen, I mean, come on. These guys are adults. They can choose if they want to smoke or not. It's not your business. You don't even know them. Now for our next entitled people story. Entitled guest thought money could get him anything. So I live on the big island of Hawaii. And last year I was working at a local resort doing concierge. Most of the job was helping people figure out what they want to do while on vacation, like snorkeling, guided hiking tours, helicopter rides, etc. One afternoon, I was approached by a guy who wanted to take a tour to the Captain Cook Monument, which is known for having great snorkeling, but is only accessible by a steep and fairly grueling hike, or by boats or kayak tour through a permitted company, of which there are only a few. He wanted to go that day or the day after, and I explained that unfortunately, all of the tours were fully booked. Unfazed and without pause, he tells me to find him another boat. I explained that only certain boats are allowed to be in that area, and all of them were full. He insisted though that I get on the phone and start calling anyone I could who had a boat that he could pay to take him there. And he kept saying, money isn't an issue, just find me a boat. I calmly explained again that that was not possible or legal and that no local boat captain would risk losing their license to take him there. Exasperated, he finally gave up on the boat and started asking about other tours. At this point, I mentioned that one of my favorite local tours is for stargazing on Mauna Kea. I know I've pronounced that incorrectly, but please, Hawaiian locals or people that know, comment down below, correct me, thanks. I told him all about the incredible sunset views and absolutely breathtaking stars and that you go up in a nice van with about 14 other people. He was interested in going up the mountain, but didn't want to be around other people or be on a tour for eight or so hours. So he tells me to call the helicopter companies and find him one that will fly him up there for a private star show. I begin explaining that the mountain is restricted airspace due to the observatories at the top. And that even if it wasn't, that not only can the local helicopters not safely make it to 14,000 feet in altitude, but none of those companies do stargazing tours because they aren't trained for it and don't have the equipment. Again, he tells me to just call around and find him a pilot willing to take him up there and again starts repeating that money isn't an issue. I once again calmly explain, while shrieking like a banshee internally, that no pilot is going to risk the loss of their license as well as fines and jail time for taking him up there. Finally, he throws up his hands and says, fine, I guess I'll just go to the beach then. Like, yeah, dude, I feel so sorry that you left planning your vacation activities until you were on vacation. Clearly have issues being told no. And now your only option is to enjoy a stunning beach in one of the most beautiful places in the world. God, I hate rich people. Oh my God. I just, yeah, absolutely despise this sort of person. Just because you've got money doesn't mean that you can have access to do whatever you want. It just, it's just not how the world works. It's just annoying that people like this have lots of money and just feel entitled to be able to say and do things like this. It's just insane. There's literal legal reasons as to why money doesn't matter in this situation and you cannot do this thing. Yet they don't get it. How dumb are they? And yeah, again, I completely agree. Now your only option 
is to enjoy a stunning beach in one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's not as if it's a bad thing, is it? Goodness me. The audacity to say, fine, I guess I'll just go and enjoy the beach then. Yeah, you will. My sister-in-law got a new engagement and wedding band, and it's the exact same one as mine. My sister-in-law copied my engagement ring, and I'm trying not to get angry. My sister-in-law has always hated me. From the moment I got with my now husband, her husband's twin, she has always hated me. The first thing she ever said to me was that I'm the longest lasting girlfriend. And since that day, there's been this weird unspoken competition where she's always trying to belittle me, making me feel small and insecure. At first it used to work, but now it just angers me. She's bragged about seeing my husband, boyfriend at the time, naked before. She's made comments about my sister's marriage unnecessarily. She's just jealous or something and has always said something to demean me. She goes and changes into outfits that match mine and literally copies me in everything. Well, me and my husband got married recently and he bought me a new ring because of our new journey in life as we'd grown so much. And then today I went to my mother-in-law's house to celebrate someone's birthday and she's here with my husband's twin. I look at her and she copied my ring. Exactly. My husband bought me a new five carat pear rose gold double halo ring and she has the exact same thing. I am so, so, so freaking angry. Also an added note, she also copied our other sister-in-law's engagement ring. My husband has seven brothers and the eldest got married first and then she did and she had the exact same ring as that girl too. So I know this behavior isn't random or a coincidence. I'm trying to contain myself because it's not a big deal and it's just materialistic things, but I'm fuming and I'm so annoyed. I literally don't want to talk to her at all on this trip. So should I confront her or just leave it alone? Yeah, now this is just extremely weird. And to be honest with you, over the history of my channel and having read a lot of stories about people like this, this is not a kind of new occurrence i want to say an individual like this in one of these stories on these entitled subreddits she's just ugh, i don't know got so much wrong with her so much jealousy we don't know why because obviously there's not a lot of context to outside what we've been given but it's just clear that she is a terrible terrible person and i don't really know what her agenda is what she's trying to do what she's trying to achieve but yeah just a horrible person that sadly is a part of your life all i can say is just try and ignore her as much as possible every little thing that she does to try and irk you or get under your skin whether it's dressing like you or having the same engagement ring made or wedding ring or whatever it is just ignore it and by doing that and not giving her any fuel to add to her stupid fire it will just drive her crazy trust me i think that's the only thing you can do here lady gets a ticket after people kindly warned her this one is from a few months ago but it's still gold there's an intersection by my work that connects two main roads, east to west and north to south. When you come to this intersection from any direction, you won't be able to turn left. There's signs everywhere telling you, no turning left. Easy, right? Well, no, not easy. Living in that town and going to work where I work for almost a decade, I've seen so many people turn left. People usually just honk and swear, but this time there was a cop waiting to go through east this lady pulls up in a nice cadillac she's coming from the south and goes to turn you guessed it left now people see the cop they know that her getting pulled over will slow down traffic as it's a two-lane street so panic ensues honking yelling some swearing one guy on the street says lady don't turn left there's a cop don't turn left don't turn left like a freaking chant everyone together this lady rolls down her window the rest of the way at this point she is mid intersection going to turn left the cop is shaking his head no bro looked like he was on lunch and he was fuming like he's close enough that i can see the sandwich bag in his car the lady though yells out and i'll never forget i can do whatever the frick i want to I will do whatever I want. And if I want to turn left, I'm freaking turning left. I don't care. And left she goes. The cop looks down. Lunchtime has been interrupted. His windows may have been closed, but you can tell when someone yells the F word. He turns around 
and puts his lights on. Of course, she pulled over. She can do whatever she wants till the cops are there. Oh, I mean, come on, woman. Everybody there is telling you not to do something. They're all trying to help you. But no, I guess that is the definition of entitlement. You feel entitled to do whatever you want. And um, yeah, you pay the repercussions because you deserve them. Like, come on. Even the cop is pretty much chanting saying, please don't do it. I'm eating my sandwich, man. Just play by the rules like everyone else does. Or the majority of people try to at least. Everyone's trying to help you. But no, I'm going to have to pull you over here. I'm going to have to do my job. And um, yeah, nobody really wanted that to happen. Apart from you, it seemed. It's just instant karma of the highest accord. And one thing is for sure, never, never interrupt a cop on their lunchtime. That is is a surefire way to get a ticket. Now for our next entitled people story. My aunt felt entitled to my money. At the beginning of the year, I decided to move across the country and change career. What I'd not anticipated was that due to stupid French insurance laws, they cover agencies and homeowners for unpaid rent only if the renter is a student, not workers in training. I couldn't find anywhere to live. My aunt was living less than an hour away from where I would work. So I called her. She was about to move away from her old apartment and apparently didn't have enough room for me in her new place. So she offered to keep renting her old place while I finish my probation period. And then once I'm able to rent, I'll move out or rent the place myself. But it came with a condition. I had to pay her the entire caution in case I break anything. And I had to buy her the kitchen she'd installed and several other pieces of furniture because it was a pain to move it. I also had to only have moving boxes, no furniture myself. I had to argue to let me have a freaking fridge. I moved in and stayed for the three months probation. Then I decided that I prefer to live near my job and move out. I cleaned my aunt's apartment. I moved my things out and the furniture she sold me, except for the kitchen, and left. Now, because I was here illegally, I had no choice in that. My name was never on the contract, but I still paid my aunt rent every month. I believed that she would receive the entire caution back and give it to me. Plus, she said she would try to resell the kitchen to the new renters and that would allow, again, me to have some money back. But she texted me yesterday that she'll only receive 30% of the caution back. Here are the reasons. She lost the key and it has to be replaced. I insist she lost a key. Charges to pay and then also garbage taxes. Here is the kicker. Those are the charges for the entire year, but I was only there for three months. Yet still, she is making me pay the entire tax. I wouldn't mind paying them for the three months I stayed, but I find the entire year to be exaggerated. Plus, I didn't lose the key, she did, and still it's up to me to pay? Her reason was, we agreed I would only give you the money that the agency is giving me back. I'm screwed because I was there illegally, so I don't have a leg to stand on. I'll just remember to never trade with that aunt again. Well, although I, I see your point, OP, that you don't have a leg to stand on because you were there illegally, you can do other things, right? You can, for example, tell your entire family about how your aunt treated you, what she made you do, and how much money she made you pay, when in reality, that was her caution that was that was what she had to pay well at the minimum nine months but probably more given as you said she was the one who lost the key so yeah i think that there's nothing you can do financially in terms of that money is gone but tell your family tell everyone make people understand what your aunt did and and that your aunt is a bad person just to clear up some things as well i'll put this on screen actually um people are asking in the comments if op was there illegally isn't your aunt the one that's liable so do nothing it's on her to fix, not you. But then someone has replied that the aunt is shorting them on the payback. There's nothing owed to the landlord. OP clears things up though. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same in the USA, but in France, you have to pay a caution when you rent a place. And when you leave, if anything is broken because of you, part of that money isn't returned. Okay, so in England, we call that a deposit then. That makes sense. To assure my aunt I was coming in good faith, I paid her the caution before arriving. I really had no choice and she took advantage of that. I see, it all makes sense. Very sad, but there we go. Entitled mum wants to pay me $3.07 an hour to watch her kids. Basically what the title says. An entitled mum reached out to me asking if I could watch her kids for 13 hours a week 
for forty dollars she wants me to one watch two kids under five two cook them meals and three clean her home my usual rate for a job like that would be 15 to 20 dollars an hour given my experience skills and qualifications and what the job is asking for when i told her my rates she cussed me out and told me it would be a privilege to watch her kids and that i should just take the job since i obviously need the money wow what a start to this episode just a short one to get things going but i felt like i had to read it and now you guys probably know why that is entitlement personified okay now for our next story slightly longer than the first and this one actually originally comes from r slash am i the jerk am i the jerk for refusing to change my daughter's clothes at a birthday party i am a 34 year old woman and i have two kids an eight-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl my daughter's name is aurora my husband and i chose that name because it was slightly similar to my late father-in-law's and worked well with our last names it had nothing to do with the princess from sleeping beauty but in spite of that we've had fun with that movie in the past and ever since my daughter realized that she shared names with a disney character princess aurora has been her favorite our family went to disney world in july and while there we bought my daughter a princess aurora costume she adores it and wears it whenever she has the chance Two weeks ago, one of Aurora's friends from school threw a princess-themed birthday party. She encouraged her friends to wear costumes. My daughter, of course, wanted to go as her favorite character, which didn't surprise me at all. When we got to the party, the birthday girl came to greet my daughter, and she was also dressed as Princess Aurora. I didn't know what her costume was going to be prior to the party. I got worried for a second, but the birthday girl was actually really excited. She said that they looked like twins. It was adorable. They ran off to play and I forgot about the costumes for a while. About 30 minutes into the party, I was at a table with some of the other mums when the birthday girl's mother came up to me. She asked if I had brought any spare clothes for Aurora. I said yes. I always bring an extra shirt and shorts for her. She then asked me to change my daughter into the spare clothes and out of her costume. The mother explained that she'd hired a photographer to walk around taking pictures of the kids and was also planning on getting a group photo near the end of the party. She didn't want anyone wearing the same costume as her daughter in these pictures. She also thought her daughter might get jealous since my kid gets to share her name with their favorite princess. Now, if the birthday girl was the one who had a problem, I might have considered changing Aurora into her spare clothes. But no, she was genuinely excited that they were dressed the same. It also didn't feel fair to force my daughter to be the only one without a costume in a party full of children in princess dresses. I said no and explained my reasoning to the girl's mum. She insisted for a few minutes, but I held my ground. Some of the other mums started to back me up and she eventually got up and left. When I went to pick up my kids earlier this week, I ran into her friend's mum. She accused me of ruining her daughter's party by allowing Aurora to wear the same costume as her. She told me she doesn't think she'll ever be able to look at the pictures without being disgusted by my behavior. I thought she was exaggerating, but I'm starting to doubt myself. Our conflict has found its way to the mum group chat that we're both in, and opinions over there are divided. Some think having two girls wear the same costume is no big deal. Others think I should have changed my daughter's clothes. So, am I the jerk? Now, guys, good news on this one is there actually is an update, which I'll get to in a second. But first of all, I've just got to give my own thoughts here. And I completely agree with OP in every single way. There's no way you're the jerk. And to be honest, yeah, all your reasoning throughout the entirety of this post makes complete sense to me. And I fully support what you did and and how you think. I agree with you. If the birthday girl herself had had an objection to this, then I think, yeah, it might have been reasonable. Although annoying and really tough on your daughter to be the only person there with out a a costume it is ultimately the birthday girl's birthday so you want to make her happy it's her special day even if it is sadly at the expense of your own daughter i would have said you know what for this one time fine it's the birthday girl's request we'll do it and hopefully your daughter understands but she was excited about it she was loving it so yeah why would you not just continue with that also if the mum really cared shouldn't she have just put in the mum's group chat before the birthday Oh, by the way, my daughter's going to be wearing a Princess Aurora costume 
please no one else wear that. She didn't put that in the chat. She didn't tell anyone. Therefore, you can't reasonably expect someone to not wear that. It's not as if Princess Aurora is a really rare princess. It's a princess-themed birthday party. I'd be shocked if there wasn't more crossover, to be honest, between other princesses. And then finally, calling it disgusting behavior. Yeah just insane but anyway let's get into the update so i've just got to add it's actually insane she's prioritizing the pictures that were being taken for herself let's be honest over her daughter's enjoyment mental but anyway let's carry on all right so here is the update op says since my post on thursday two days after the mum group started debating three things happened one on friday my husband went to pick up the kids the parents of one of my son's friends who have a younger son in my daughter's class asked if he knew about the costume fiasco or as my friends are calling it aurora gates <laughs> wow i told him everything he said the birthday girl's mother was being ridiculous as i had no idea what her daughter's costume would be exactly the mum he was talking to asked wait she didn't know she called me and i told her my side it turns out that the birthday girl's mum told people that i had been informed about the costume and to avoid dressing aurora the same weeks prior to the party the story was warped before it even got to the group chat my side of the story made it to the group chat after some pressure the birthday girl's mum eventually confessed that she'd lied about me most of the other mums had apologized to me by sunday oh my gosh that is awful she's doubled down on her entitlement by lying wow second also apologizing to us on sunday were the birthday girl's father and maternal grandmother she's visiting them for a few weeks Apparently, the birthday girl's mum had been complaining about the party almost daily. Since they got the photos back, the birthday girl's mum has been insisting that there isn't a single good picture of my daughter without another girl wearing the same costume. Aurora and the birthday girl were playing together most of the party. Yeah, not that surprising given that we know the birthday girl was really excited that someone else was wearing the same costume as her. Anyway, she was especially upset about the group photo which shows the birthday girl in the center and my daughter to her right now there are two girls between them but she still thinks they're too close to each other the birthday girl's dad had been listening to these complaints since the party he told us that unless his daughter was in the room he couldn't look at the pictures without his wife making a comment about me my daughter or how we ruined the birthday girl's birthday it came to a head on saturday while talking with the grandmother after the birthday girl went to bed the mother said she no longer wanted to make a photo album of the party. They'd gotten a photographer for both album and social media purposes. Both the birthday girl's dad and her grandmother wanted the album. The three had a fight that lasted about 15 minutes before the grandmother told the birthday girl's mom to stop obsessing over her daughter's friend. She said that all that matters is that the birthday girl had fun and all of the photos reflect that. They told us all that when they called to apologize. They wanted the birthday girl's mum to apologize too, but she hasn't. And three, Aurora came home from school yesterday wearing a headband with her name and a rose embroidered on it. The birthday girl had her grandmother make it for her. Me and my husband are still in contact with the birthday girl's father and we're trying to set up a play date for the girls next week. Also, there are some things that I want to clarify about my previous post. My daughter and the birthday girl aren't physically similar. Aurora has wavy brown hair. The birthday girl has straight blonde hair. Yeah, we're all Caucasian, but my daughter is more tanned. Also, their dresses weren't the exact same, and OP has actually linked a couple of pictures here of the two dresses. So the one on the left, if you are watching on YouTube, is her daughter's costume, and the one on the right is the birthday girl's costume. So look, you can see that they're similar, but there are differences. And let's be honest, a lot of traditional you know disney princess dresses are very similar anyway people are going to be looking similar at this party the thing i would say with these two is that they are actually just very different shades of pink the first is very very light salmon pink the second is pink but there's a clear difference you're not going to get these children confused next up the party was held at a kids party venue not the birthday girls place there were 19 girls and a toddler at the party all were in costume there were a few boys, but they were older. I'm guessing they were related to the birthday girl. Before, I was never friends with the birthday girl's mum. 
Her request at the party was probably the third time we ever talked and the first that wasn't about the weather. Also, the birthday girl's mother didn't want me to change my daughter's clothes just for the group photo at the end. She wanted me to change her 30 minutes into the party for all the pictures. I mentioned in a comment that if the birthday girl had a problem with my daughter's costume, I might be willing to drive home, change Aurora into her Merida dress, or Merida dress perhaps, which is her second favorite, and then return to the party. Wow, so OP would have been willing to go through a lot of effort to, to do something that the birthday girl requested. But OP wants to stress that they'd only do that if the birthday girl was upset when we got to the party. Not if her mother was annoyed half an hour later. By then my daughter was already playing with the birthday girl and her friends. And finally, to those who said I could change Aurora at the party and or use this as a teaching moment, I'm going to assume you've never met a four-year-old. So where's the teaching moment here though? And also, what are you gonna change Aurora into? As you said, you only have a shirt and shorts that's not a princess. That's a strange comment, whoever left that. Anyway, my daughter is kind-hearted and would definitely do it to make her friend happy but she would still view this as punishment. It's also cruel to take a child away from a party and tell them they can no longer play princess with their friends. I refuse to alienate or upset my daughter when she's done nothing wrong. I absolutely don't regret my decision. And that's it. Once again, thank you all. Yeah, there we go. Good resolution in my opinion. Uh, as you can probably expect, on the initial post, there were a lot of positive comments. I mean, people pretty much just saying what I said you've done everything right op and this woman is just entitled once again though you know sometimes you do need to post these things online just to check that you're not going crazy you need to get other people's opinions because i mean who knows op genuinely might have thought she was in the wrong or had missed something but yeah when you see this outpouring of support that we saw on the initial post in the comments. I mean, there are literally hundreds, thousands of comments saying, no, you were right, don't worry. Yeah, it is good to know. Okay, I'm not going crazy. Clearly this woman is just really entitled. I actually can't believe as well, the fact that she warped the story, she lied about you. That is the crazy part because if people have believed that, then yeah, that would make you look terrible. Imagine if somebody said, by the way, please don't wear this dress or please don't have your kid wear this dress to my daughter's party and you still put your kid in that dress, it would make you look like a terrible person. It's just terrible that she's even trying to do that. But um, yeah, good thing that everyone believed you. It's good to hear. And now for our final story of this episode. Entitled mum is mad that I intend to convert the guest room into my office after the birth of my second kid. I'm currently 21 weeks pregnant with my second baby. Both my husband and I work from home full time. We recently decided that my current office will be a great room as the nursery for the new baby. We started packing up and moving stuff around in preparation. My mum is currently visiting from out of the country and staying with us. She saw what we were doing and commented, So you and your hubby are going to both squeeze into his small office? I told her that's not the case. I intend to convert the guest room into my office once the second kid is old enough to attend daycare or preschool at around 18 months. But we'll put a sofa bed in there or have some Japanese futons in case we were to have guests. They'll have a place to sleep and chill out after I get off work. Interestingly, I have told her that plan in the past of a video chat and she thought it was a good idea back then. She claimed to have no recollection of that conversation happening and immediately proceeded to get passive aggressive with me saying, okay, fine, I won't visit again then. I had to remind her that it's not happening till at least two years from now and there will still be space for her to stay in when she comes to visit. Besides, when my husband and I are working during the day, we hardly spend any time in the living room or family room. She has access to all those spaces. She essentially sees our current guest room as her room and expects us to keep it that way for the foreseeable future for the few days out of the year that she's visiting. Other than that, it will just be a vacant bedroom that no one spends any time in. She complained to my dad, who actually confirmed that I have indeed spoken to them about my plan. So now she's also embarrassed at getting called out for opposing to what she'd said in the past. She just felt like she's entitled to that room in my house, even though she spends only one month total of the year visiting us. She's been giving me the silent treatment since the argument and whenever I try to talk to her, she'd answer with a ton of attitude, basically telling me to F off. Both my husband and I find her reaction ridiculous and we're not ready to coddle up to her unreasonable demands just to keep her happy. 
Well, simple solution here in my opinion. If she's not happy with your room in your house that she gets to stay in for free, then she can just book a hotel room. Simple as that, right? I mean, you're getting offered free accommodation and a free place to stay. Yeah, it's your family. And in my opinion, that should be expected. But you are. Those are the facts. If you don't like it, you don't want to stay there. Pay for somewhere that you like. I think that's very simple. Okay, so here is the update posted just one day later. I checked the camera footage last night slash this morning. My half sister and my biological mum's mother had been looking under mats, rocks, in potted plants, the mailbox and checking the doors, probably looking for a spare key. I don't keep one on my property and my dad, grandma and grandpa have keys they keep with theirs. My uncle did an overhaul of mine and dad's cameras. We now have ones that send notifications to our phones when motion is detected. Also got ring doorbells for the front and back doors. There are other features and all the cameras are better hidden as well. I went to the police department while he was doing this and I brought my grandpa with me. My half sister was booked for trespassing, but not held very long since my biological mum's mother picked her up from the station. They stuck to the lie of me offering my half sister a place to stay and gave statements. Not sure how that's going to go, but I'm taking steps to protect myself, my property, and my dad and his property. My half sister doesn't have a record beyond this, so this was her first offense. I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest. It sounds awful, but I'd hoped she would have had at least one prior because commenters make it seem like that would make the outcome of a permanent restraining order or trespassing order favorable. My biological mother's mother does have a record though. Harassment, trespassing, and domestic violence. I shared this with the police as well. Either way, I was able to get a temporary restraining order today. So there's that. I gave the camera footage to the police alongside copies of the text, printed out and on USB. I gave a statement and they called a judge to get the temporary restraining order issued. I talked with them about other things like self-defense recommendations, overhauling my security system, getting a gun for protection, and so on. I was really anxious and just kept talking because it finally hit me that these people know where I live and they're willing to make the six hours to harass me and get inside my home. You know what? That slipped my mind there for a second, guys. They made that six hour journey, didn't they? With no kind of assurity or reassurances that your half sister was going to be let in by you. They were just doing that on a whim, right? That's mad. The text and voice messages haven't stopped. I unblocked and muted. There are direct and indirect threats. My biological mother's mother is adamant that since I have an entire house to myself, a stable job, and no children, I will be housing my half-sister, or she'd give me the butt whipping my dad should have. My half-sister has only left one voice message about coming over later today, and that she's staying with me because that's what blood does, they help. When there was no response, she sent multiple texts telling me I need to be more understanding, that she's in a tough spot and that she's moving in for at least a week until she's able to support herself. It's seven days to gain tenancy here. Additional clarification for people asking about the age gap. I am a February 1st baby. My half sister is a November 29th baby. I say exactly nine months because I'm not counting the weeks and days. I just felt that people knowing we're the same age was relevant and gave context as to why I have no relationship with her. I don't know if she was premature. I never asked, to be honest, and there are people saying they have similar age gaps around them, so I've got nothing to add there. Now, multiple people also asked if I hate my half-sister and that I sound resentful for things she said as a child and for things her parents did. In my first post, I talked to somebody in the comments and admitted that had this been a few years earlier, I may have helped her out without much thought. I know as children, she was just parroting her parents. I don't fault her for that, nor do I blame her for my biological mother abandoning me. But it's been 17 years. We've been legal adults for seven of those years. She could have reached out at any point, but she didn't and said she had no sister. I also could have reached out at any point, but I also didn't. I just moved on with my life. I've been in therapy since I was abandoned and it took me years to move on from no one on that side actually wanting me. My biological mother's mother aside, my half sister was sitting on my porch with a suitcase ready to force herself into my home and life. She allowed herself to be driven six hours to my home, sat on my porch for half an hour and then lied to police all after I said no multiple times. 
She never claimed me until she needed something and now she's forcing herself into my life on the basis of being family. I don't hate her. That's too much energy. But I do resent her now alongside her grandmother and the rest of her family. I was ignored for years and now I feel unsafe in my own home just because my half sister and those around her can't take no for an answer. This isn't about my biological mum's affair. This is about my half sister and her family ruining my safe space, my home with their trash. The past is a factor in that resentment now because again, I haven't spoken to her in 17 years. I didn't know what she looked like, but suddenly we're sisters because she needs some place to stay. I definitely resent that. Also, I feel validated in my choices. Posting to Reddit, asking for and taking advice, listening to my dad. The attorney I spoke to pretty much said all the things that commenters have. Unblocking and muting to get evidence of harassment, calling the cops and showing them the messages because it proves there was no implied invitation. This is apparently the biggest thing I had to worry about because even letting my half-sister stay on my porch could have worked against me. Giving the cops the camera footage of my half-sister and biological mother's mother looking for a spare key was also a good move. Even going about upgrading security, getting self-defense items, and asking the officers about self-defense recommendations and my wish to get a gun for protection works in my favor. It shows that even though this was my half-sister's first offense, I don't feel safe, and she is a major cause of that. And I don't. So thank you again for all the advice. If they show up, like they said, I'm going to set off my security system and call the cops. Now, guys, you might be thinking that that is the end of this one. It seems like it's come to a logical conclusion. And to be fair, the story, at least, that event has. But actually, OP has posted another little bit of information. It's actually a, a series of text messages from a cousin of hers that shed even more light onto her biological mother, that side of the family, her half-sister, her ex-grandma, I guess, her biological mother's mother now. And that is really, really interesting. We're going to get into that in just a minute or so. But, but first of all, on this, again, all I can really say is that you've done the right thing. These people are an absolute disgrace. Just coming to you in their time of need. And yeah, ultimately, they are very, very entitled people. I mean, being entitled is one thing. It's when you actually are now feeling unsafe in your own home and they're kind of feeling a little bit unhinged for want of a better word that it becomes dangerous and actually quite scary because who knows as you said if they're willing to drive six hours to do this and you felt the need to ask the police about you know do i need a gun here for self-defense that is kind of getting past inside of really and it's becoming dangerous so yeah all i'd say even for a further recommendation maybe get some extra locks get a big dog get a fence build a wall I don't want to make a joke here but you know like as as you say you, you feel scared you need people to protect you get your dad involved maybe go and get your dad to move in with you for, for a period of time until this is till this is kind of dealt with because uh yeah as you say scary stuff but anyway let's get into that final bit of info so here we are concerned cousin on half sister is what op has titled this one i was going through the first messages sent to me and i found one of the many that i muted without reading this is from a cousin of my half sister so here it is they say your half sister's biological father cut contact with your half sister when she was 20. she covered up your biological mother's affair with her current husband wow i guess that's a new man into the equation right i'm not sure it could be the same person as before no it can't have been right wow she covered up her biological mother your biological mother's affair with another man her current husband okay so then the half sister's biological father stopped paying her tuition and cut her off financially the half sister's work history is non-existent she was kicked out by your biological mother a month ago because she was sleeping with sorry what she was sleeping with the man that your biological mother was having an affair with and one of his sons said son turned 18 two months ago what your half-sister came home to hers and her mother's partner's things on the curb and all the locks changed. I, I Sorry, I, I say her mother's partner. It's her mother's husband. Sorry, this girl was sleeping with 
her mother's husband and one of his sons and then covered up that entire thing to her own dad what just happened to this story police weren't involved the cousin who told op about this doesn't know if op's biological mother told the boy's mother but she did tell the entire family essentially said protect your kids and marriage op's half-sister claims she only slept with him on his birthday but her mother claims he was a minor when op's half-sister slept with him the family is adamant about getting her somewhere safe to stay long term because oh my goodness me would you believe it op's half-sister is pregnant no one likes her but they believe abandoning her is wrong due to her being pregnant the cousin expresses doubt about the pregnancy wow really so the cousin who is telling op about all of this isn't even sure if her half-sister is pregnant or it's a lie what the half-sister showed op's maternal grandmother a positive pregnancy test but no one else has been given any proof and the half-sister has a history of lying now do we even know for sure if the half-sister did show op's maternal grandmother a positive pregnancy test remember that this grandmother was the one that was willing to drive six hours with op's half-sister to drop her off at op's home with no guarantee of her letting her stay honestly what is going on here op's half-sister couch surfed with those that don't have kids so far she's borrowed someone's car without permission taken expensive items to pawn taken money meant for interview clothes and travel then blew it on expensive mum and baby outfits when cops were involved she lies and has gotten someone arrested by claiming sa when they try to have her removed from their property what oh my goodness me this person gets worse and worse with every word the plot to get my half sister into my house was the idea of an uncle one of my grandma's three sons my grandma apparently brags slash complains about me being young with no kids a well-paid job and a house that i own essentially this uncle said i had no responsibilities disposable income and plenty of room because nobody wants to outright abandon my half sister this was the best plan in inverted commas this is the final message from op's cousin don't give an inch not even a ride to a shelter someone tried and she caused the scene nearly getting them arrested because she kept lying about the situation please read this i read your two posts stay safe okay well we knew she was bad before but now i cannot actually believe what i've just read you guys could probably hear my dismay and utter disbelief whilst i was reading those last paragraphs absolutely insane i mean let's have a look at what the people on reddit are saying to that because <laughs> unbelievable someone has said great job for the cousin for filling in these outrageous blanks wow i completely agree with that because there is so much information that the cousin has given you there that you otherwise wouldn't have known we wouldn't have known which is so so bad i mean look again i thought it was bad anyway but this is just another level so much illegal stuff just horrible stuff so immoral and unethical just clearly shows your half sister at least as well as to be fair other members of her family to be just absolutely disgusting individuals again comment down below guys what do you think about this what do you think about this <laughs> i just need to go back and kind of understand just what was going on there your half sister had sex with the dude that your mum cheated with on the dude that she cheated on your dad with and then his kid as well is that right your family was then going to trojan horse her and potentially a newborn although we don't know if she actually is pregnant or not into your house unbelievable unbelievable um and to be honest if they were going to do that those would be the only trojans your half sister would ever see my best friend's ex-mother-in-law demands my friend become a submissive wife to her stalker son this is an ongoing mess with my 29 year old female best friends 30 year old female ex 29 year old male and now her ex-mother-in-law i have her permission to post this now my bestie never married her ex but for simplicity's sake i'll refer to her ex's parents as ex-mother-in-law and ex-father-in-law 
my bestie and I live together with my parents in a newly bought house She is pretty much a daughter to my parents and we are platonic life partners by this point Her ex ghosted her for three years and has been hounding her ever since he found out we bought a house Trying to get her to take him back and live in our house We've tried reaching out to the police, but since nothing serious has happened We've reached a wall and we can only wait her ex-in-laws no longer live in the us But they did come for thanksgiving though my bestie is no longer dating their son She offered to pick them up at the airport and take them to the hotel The reason I was told was they would do that for her when she was in college I didn't like it since her ex is a problem But she wanted to use the chance to ask her ex's parents to intervene and maybe get him off her back I still didn't like it but I figured they probably were okay based on how she described them. And I was completely wrong. My bestie arrived in tears and with a scratched cheek. Immediately, I asked her what happened, and now I'm seeing red. The next part comes from how my bestie described things to me. She told me picking them up went well, and they talked about the old days. They asked my bestie if they could stop in a nearby restaurant they always liked, and she, being her usual self, decided to treat them to lunch. All hell broke loose in the restaurant, though. Apparently, her ex-mother-in-law demanded to know why she didn't take her abusive stalker ex back. According to her ex-mother-in-law, my bestie is responsible for her baby boy since she was his first girlfriend and they were married in the eyes of God. To start, they never legally married and my bestie is an atheist. So, yeah. She tried to defuse the situation, explaining that she's moved on with her life after three years of not knowing where he was. She did try to ask her ex-mother-in-law to convince her son to leave her alone and that she just doesn't want him in her life anymore. Her ex-father-in-law seemed to agree with her and apologize for all the heartache and pain that she's gone through. Her ex-mother-in-law, however, took over the conversation and began screaming that thanks to my bestie, her son had no life. That apparently my bestie was responsible for her firstborn not having a wife or children. The least she could do is take responsibility and become the submissive wife he deserved. The ex-father-in-law tried to pull his wife away, more than likely because they were causing a very public scene. My bestie simply said she would not ever consider marriage to her ex. She then said it might be best to take the food to go and for them to go to their hotel. She paid for all the food despite the ex-father-in-law offering to cover his and his wife's meal and still drove them to the hotel. At the hotel is where things went from one to 100. The ex-mother-in-law had spent the whole drive escalating demands from taking him back to marrying him to have a child and give her son the house as the man in the relationship. The ex-father-in-law apparently kept telling her to stop, but there was no way she could be quiet. Finally, my bestie had had enough. She stopped the car and told her ex-mother-in-law she will never take a failure of a man like her baby boy as a husband, let alone give birth to his spawn. That she was glad that no other woman had stayed long term with him since he really won't be a good addition to the gene pool. I gotta admit, I'm proud of her for that last one. The ex-mother-in-law went crazy and jumped on my friend. Her husband luckily grabbed her, but she still managed to get my friend on the cheek. She began screaming that she was the reason her family had split, called her the W word, although it was actually a different word, and said she wished our house burnt with all of us inside. The ex-father-in-law just told my friend to drop their bags on the sidewalk and drive away while he held back his demon of a wife. And my bestie did exactly that. The next thing she did was drive back to us. She was not so much hurt by the insults or even the attack, but more the notion that a woman she once saw as a second mother would treat her like this. I told her to just relax a bit, so she's watching some movies with the dogs while I write this and do some work. Tomorrow, we're both calling out and just having a girl's day with my mum. I did get in touch with the ex's sister and let her know what happened. She already knew from her dad and asked me if my bestie was pressing charges. She should, but she's not. I tried to convince her, but it's a sore topic for her, so for her emotional well-being, I'm not going to push it. The sister said she appreciates that we're not pressing charges and that she will make sure her family doesn't bother us in any way. Apparently, she already had her brother moved outside the city. I'm not sure how or where, but I'm glad he's gone. So hopefully we're done. 
We're going to avoid going out too often until we know the ex-monster-in-law is gone from the city. It's not a small city by any means, but I wouldn't put it past these crazies to try and stalk my bestie. But that is not the end of the story, guys. Before we get into my thoughts, we actually have an update. After Thanksgiving dinner, my mum sat with my bestie to have a serious talk. She told her she didn't want to diagnose her, but she was showing clear signs that she needed help and therapy could be an option. They had a discussion about it and my friend agreed to seek professional help. Since she lives with my mum, she's not an option, but mum is going to help her find someone. We just came from filing a police report. My friend won't press charges, but we made a paper trail to ensure that it's at least on the record. She apologizes for not doing it immediately and for going to meet her ex-in-laws. I told her I understand that she's going through a lot of things. We'll see how things go but she's like a sister to me and I refuse to let her go through it alone. As for people in the comments saying I have feelings for her, please stop, like seriously stop. She's my family and I don't see her in any romantic or sexual way. It's annoying that people assume that just because I'm bi and have a strong friendship means I have romantic feelings. And to the person who made a comment about her ex-in-laws being entitled or Muslim, that is inappropriate and extremely racist. Wow. It's the same mentality that my friends and I have to constantly deal with because we are Hispanics. I seriously dislike people like this. Uh, yeah, a bit of a strange last comment to end the update on. Uh, all I'll say to that is, OP, I'm sorry that you have to deal with stuff like that and people like that every day. That is very, very weird. Don't want to see that on Reddit. However, let's get into my thoughts on the entire story. The thing that actually just screams out to me is that despite all the obvious trauma and, I don't know, hardship that will come with filing a police report or pressing charges, I do feel like that is the the logical step, right? I feel like that has to happen. Otherwise, you're not really preventing something like this from happening in the future. It's worth it, in my opinion, going through these steps now, even though I can tell that your bestie OP really doesn't want to, in order for this not to happen again. Because yes, it's tough to do it in the short term. You don't want to do it. But what's tougher? Pressing charges now or having to deal with this sort of thing happening once again in the future. I mean, who knows how many times. Take the L in the short term, get it done. I don't know exactly what would come of that, but surely you could be entitled to some form of restraining order or something. I mean, I don't know. If you know about the law more than me, guys, comment down below. Let me know what you think could happen as a result of of pressing charges. But yeah, off the bat, you just got to do something or things will never change. Okay, now for our next entitled people story of this episode. A woman in a supermarket tried to eject me from and take my wheelchair. So there I, a 39 year old non-binary was in a rural Shores. For those not in an area with a Shores, it's a standard supermarket with a club that makes things cheaper, which is their way of hiding their markup. Stuff is just cheaper a few miles down the road. Unfortunately, there were a few things I could only get there, like my flavor of lifeblood, also known as caffeine, and food for the dogs. I was using my power chair, which back then I needed more often. It's an Eagle HD foldable deal, and it works great. I've been hit pretty hard by post-COVID and was very sedentary at that time in my life, along with a pre-existing joint problem. So I'm leaning forward to get a flat of Monster and stick it under my seat on the rack when a woman pushes on my back and says, I need that. You don't. You're younger. As I was belted in, nothing happened. It was only luck that I was belted in. Usually I would have undone it to pick up something heavy. I sat up and pushed her hands off of me, saying, what the frick? And she shakes the back of my chair like it's a dinner chair or something and goes, you can use the scooter. The chair is better and I'm old. She points at the trashy supermarket scooter that she's using. I stare at her in total shock for a moment and say, this is my wheelchair. Get away from me. You can't use personal stuff in supermarkets. Give me the chair. She started like shaking it with each statement. So at that point, I just hit the maximum speed on my power chair and took off, ripping it out of her hands. It was either let go or be dragged on her face because she clearly wasn't super steady and needed a scooter herself. And we're off on the dumbest chase in creation, mostly because supermarket scooters go slower than any other mobility device. I buzzed over to the service desk and cut the line and said, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, but there's a woman following me trying to push me out of my chair and take it. And from behind me, they can hear, get back here. 
and the most wheezy buzz of the slow scooter. Oh, guys, I'm just picturing this right now in my head. And it's absolutely phenomenal. I feel like we need to make a cartoon animation out of this story. In the moment, it was really enraging that she was being so entitled and frustrating. And I just wanted to get my dog food and leave. But in memory, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, there you go. I can't imagine how it couldn't be funny. They let me into the little back office area. And they and the whole line of people waiting just sort of watched as she came over. And it took so long. The scooter was so slow and she's yelling about how I don't need the chair and how she should get it because she's older and more disabled. It takes like a full 20 seconds for her to get from one end of the store to the other. Everyone is just staring as she rides full of glory at 0 0.00001 mile per hour with her face red and her glasses hanging off one ear. So she finally gets to the desk and they calmly explain that the wheelchair isn't store property. And if she tries to steal from another customer, they'll have to call the police. She starts shouting at the employees that she knows full well you can't bring personal equipment into the supermarket. So they're lying. And the other woman behind the counter says with a bit more attitude, Lady, why do you think we care if you bring a wheelchair into the supermarket? At this point, I think like something either clicked or she just realized that an entire line of people was staring at her and not kindly she suddenly asked where to find the artichokes i almost coughed on my own spit the worker just stared back and pointed back where the woman had come and said produce and the woman left i admit that for the rest of my visit i avoided any aisle she was in because i didn't want her close enough to grab me again now that's fair enough now I can laugh about it for the absurdest comedy moment it was. In retrospect, I feel there's a reason here. Like her husband told her they shouldn't buy a thing like I had because they're not allowed to be in the supermarket. That's the best answer I can possibly come up with for that wild nonsense. Wherever you are, crazy lady, I hope you bought your own Eagle HD. All right, now before we end this one, first of all, just got a couple of commonly asked questions in the comments that OP has responded to. First of all, how could you fit a flat of Monster Energy drink on your wheelchair? Yeah, fair question. Well, OP says, check out the Eagle HD on Discover My Mobility. And um, she's actually linked the website. And I've got to say, it is probably the worst website I've ever been on in my life. Uh, if you do want to go and check it out, don't it feels like i've just been transported back into the 1640s but nonetheless here is a picture on screen of the eagle hd in all its glory uh, i mean honestly this website is so trash i cannot possibly believe how bad this website is wow i mean this is an absolute disgrace to websites everywhere this might be the worst website i've ever seen in the history of websites nonetheless that's not important the eagle hd is important and as you can see, there's a rack underneath the seat. While the flat doesn't fit in the basket, it sits on top of the arms of the basket evenly. Um, you know, that's a good answer, OP. I'm sorry, I just cannot get over how bad this website is. Nonetheless, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it's a wheelchair. If you're not, it's a wheelchair. Let's move on to the next commonly asked question. Someone else said, you should call to get the video. Wow, I concur. Interestingly, OP says, someone on the post is connecting me with a regional person who might have any ability to get it. We'll see. It's very likely been recorded over since it was three years ago. I didn't know it was three years ago. I was hoping that we might get some juicy video content. Someone else says, why didn't you immediately call the cops and have her arrested? Well, OP says, have you ever lived in a rural town? It's actually really hard to get the cops to do anything about anything in a rural town for a variety of reasons. Getting cops to arrest an old lady in a small town would be nigh impossible and stupid. They'd be crucified by the public, no matter what she was doing. I mean, really, is that necessarily true? What if she was committing a heinous crime? For example, murdering an entire family. I feel like people wouldn't really be like, oh, well, you can't arrest her. She's one of the guys, you know, she's a neighbor of mine. No, she's committing an atrocity. She must be put away. And then finally, someone has said, you should stand up for yourself. <laughs> um, now, I hope this is not ironic. Well, I mean, it is ironic. Uh, I don't know. Can't help but find that kind of funny. <laughs> well, anyway, Opie has said thank you to this um, and then said I did. 
by going and taking the best legal and socially acceptable way out. Uh, sorry, if anyone out there listening um, has issues walking and is in a wheelchair, I'm sorry. That is funny, objectively. Anyway, it's very easy to armchair quarterback someone else's life from the sidelines, but you know, most situations don't end with a verbal or physical confrontation that has swelling or casual moments and a drop beat on the big punch. That's a shame. I kind of wish they did. Most of them end with annoyance in a sense that my day was disrupted with no resolution. It would be great to give you that resolution with a backstory of me standing up to a bully, but that's not what actually happened. Instead, it was a really unthinking old lady who just needed to be kept at a distance until she could understand reality. And finally, a giant thank you to everyone who gave compliments to the story and narrative. Yeah, I agree with that. It was very good. In case I miss replying to any individual comments, I appreciate them all. Next time, I'll share the story of why I ended up hiding from eight toddlers under a table. Oh my goodness me. What is it with OP? Just painting a wonderful picture in my mind. Instantly, I've got a phenomenal canvas in my head of, of you just hiding under a table and eight toddlers searching or just standing on top of it. Just absolutely dominating the room. I've got to hear that story. Entitled person wants me to leave because I look like Santa. So I am homeless. No, I don't drink and no, I don't do drugs. I am trying to get a job, but finding employment when homeless is not an easy task. That's just something I need to get out of the way. Every few days, I take a trip to the library to charge my phone and batteries so I can keep my phone on and working. I typically spend three to four hours in a quiet corner of the library, glued to the power outlet charging. Today, I had a cute, then frustrating interaction between a little kid and its parents. I walked through the sliding doors of the library and wandered around looking for an open chair near an outlet to sit and charge. I heard this little voice shout in excitement and glee, Santa, and pitter patters of little boots running over to me. Now, I get it, I really do. A big bearded man dressed in red with big black bags and an oversized backpack strapped over his shoulders any little kid would easily mistake me for the big jolly man. The kid stopped dead in front of me. She was clenching her fists tight, trembling in excitement. She couldn't have been more than four years old. She looked up at me, her eyes opened wide and uttered the word, Hi Santa. That made me smile and I laughed. Her mother came running over, scooped up her child and said sorry to me, walked away and told her kid that's not Santa. The entire interaction put a smile on my face, but here's where it went downhill. I found an open seat and plugged into charge and do my thing. The little kid and her parent were on the other side of the library, but the kid was still brimming with excitement. I could see her head poke out of the bookshelf, staring at me every so often. That went on for about half an hour until I guess the mother couldn't handle her child anymore and she came over to me. She asked me to leave and find a different spot because I am distracting her daughter. I said, hey, look, I'm sorry, but this is the only open space with an outlet. I need to charge my stuff. She very sarcastically said, oh, why is that? I replied, because I don't have one. I am homeless. I thought that was the end of it because her face went red and she walked away. But no, she came back. She went up to the front desk to ask if there are any outlets outside and if it's okay for me to use them. Seriously, she said that the library is okay with me using the outlet outside to charge so I can go out there. I asked her, so you don't want me in the library, a public institution, to charge my phone? You would rather me sit outside in the cold just because your kid thinks I'm Santa? Really, that's it. I looked at her and said, well, ho, 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 Merry Christmas to you. I'm going to stay right here until my batteries are charged. The lady went to the front desk and I listened in because I figured I'm screwed. I'm getting kicked out. She asked them to tell me to leave. They said they can't unless I'm intentionally making a disturbance, being violent or threatening. I've been here before. I keep to myself and I don't bother anyone. So yeah, I was there for four hours. I didn't move or get kicked out. My things are charged and good for the next few days. Honestly, not the worst interaction I've ever experienced. At least she was somewhat polite. Okay, yeah, this is just ridiculous. If your daughter is being distracted by something, like another person, you can't go over to them and say, stop doing what you're doing. How about you take your daughter away from the distraction or just tell her to focus on the thing that you want her to be focusing on? You can't just tell a random person to stop being there. That's insane. And then she's trying to get you kicked out. 
how 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 are you supposed to be the one that's in control of a four-year-old's attention span what are you gonna do about that like it's not your fault you look like santa and the girl's excited to see santa crazy yeah entitlement 101 i will say though that although you do say at the end it's not the worst interaction you've had and she was somewhat polite i don't really know if that's that polite asking you to be kicked out of a public place where you were just chilling out opie has also said at the end a little edit i don't think she was being malicious at all i think in her mind she was doing a good deed maybe you're right there opie to be fair but i don't know how she thought that was a good deed crazy now for our second entitled people story grandma karen decides to unhook an autistic child's harness this happened several years ago i was a photographer for a major theme park and have dealt with my fair share of entitled karens or brats but there's only been one time i've had to call security because of a karen i was working with a character one afternoon and one of the families that stopped by to pay a visit was this family of three with mum, dad and a five-year-old boy that i'll name malcolm Malcolm is strapped to a harness attached to mum's waist. Think those jogging harnesses for blind runners to keep him close to his mum and dad. Dad pulled the character attendant and me aside and alerted us that Malcolm was a non-verbal autistic and camera flashes were overstimulating to him. Now, this was a pretty common request, so I adjusted my settings so I wouldn't have to use the flash and I thanked him for alerting me. It's Malcolm's turn and he was such a sweetheart. He just wanted to show off the book full of pictures of his favorite dinosaurs and we all got sad when he had to leave a few hours later i was in an area we refer to as backstage where guests aren't allowed heading to my break imagine my surprise when all of a sudden i get body slammed by malcolm for the record i'm almost six foot and 250 pounds and he nearly managed to knock me over. He's screaming and crying. Fortunately, my manager, Oscar, was nearby, so I flagged him down and we immediately called security. We get Malcolm to a cool air-conditioned place as it's 95 degrees, and I looked up pictures of dinosaurs on my phone to show Malcolm. Eventually, he calmed down and essentially became my little buddy. About 10 minutes later, Malcolm is reunited with a tearful mum and dad. It's there we got the full story. Enter Karen. Mum, Dad and Malcolm were getting ice cream when Karen approached. The conversation went roughly as follows. Why is he harnessed? Asked the Karen. Oh, he's autistic and he will bolt if he's not harnessed, said Malcolm's mum. No, he's not. Excuse me? You're just a bad parent. My grandson knows better than to stray from me and he's about the same age, the Karen said. I'm sorry, but he's incapable of understanding that. It's safer for everyone if he's harnessed, Malcolm's mum replied. It's at this point that dad comes back with the ice cream and mum turns her attention away to help him. The next thing she knows, the harness goes slack. When she looked up, Malcolm and Karen are gone. It's so packed that day that it's easy to lose track of someone, especially if it's a running child. An important thing to know is that the park has cameras everywhere. So it was easy to get a video of the incident and a description of the Karen. Security was alerted and she was tracked down. She was belligerent and tried to slap the security guard who stopped her, stupidly doing it in front of an off-the-clock sheriff. So she got a lovely court date for her soul as a result. Malcolm and his family were given an extra day added to their tickets as an apology for what happened. But they had just one request. They asked to know where I would be the next day so I could take their pictures. The next day, I gave them a full-on photo shoot. And yes, it was the best day of my entire career. Wow, great story. Very, very wholesome. OP, I've got to say, you seem like an absolutely lovely person. Yeah, crazy to ever touch someone else's child or anything associated with them without any prompt from their parents and then do this i mean it's very very dangerous what if he just ran off and was never found or was abducted you know it's a crazy suggestion but it happens doesn't it extremely dangerous and yeah definitely deserves to be arrested crazy now for our next entitled people story entitled army wife versus major general so this isn't my story but from one of my friends This happened a long time ago, and some names and details have been changed to protect the innocent. My friend, who I'll call Lucy, lives in a town with a pretty good-sized army base. To make some money between semesters of college, Lucy took a summer job as a waitress at a local restaurant that is popular with the officers and their families. She is liked as a waitress to the point that patrons will ask to be seated in her section. But you're not here for that story, are you? You're here for the entire two people, OP. You know me too well. And oh boy, did Karen not disappoint. It was a Friday evening, so it was packed. There's at least an hour wait. 
the kitchen is zipping, and Lucy and her co-workers are on their toes. Fortunately, it's mostly regulars, so they're patient and even leaving nice tips and paying compliments to the wait staff and the owner. Enter Karen. Karen, who Lucy had never seen before, was seated in Lucy's section and begins the usual Karen tirades complaining about the weight, sending her pasta dish back a total of three times because it wasn't cooked just right, husband's rank name dropping, yada, yada, yada. Now, Lucy is easily the most patient and kind-hearted person I've ever met, but even she was getting frustrated. Then the bombshell dropped. Like most places in this town, the restaurant offers a military discount. However, thanks to this being abused in the past, people wanting the military discount must now show their military ID in order to qualify. There are signs posted on the doors and in the menu stating this. Most patrons understand. But as you can guess, Karen is not one of those people. It's time for the check and Karen asks for the military discount. Lucy, polite as ever, asks for Karen's military ID. What did you say? Karen says, can you please present your military ID for the discount? Don't you know who I am? I'm sorry, mom, but company rules state that your ID must be shown to get the discount. Are you calling me a liar? No, mom, but in order to qualify for the discount, you must show your military ID. My husband is Kyle, married to a B word. I mean, insert real name there, I guess. He is a second lieutenant at the army base and he knows people. For those of you not watching on YouTube right now, the word knows is in capital letters. Like he really knows people. Lucy is trying to keep her cool, but she told me that she wanted to cry at this point. Also, I know people. I can make sure you never get a job in this town again. You're so stupid. You're probably some college dropout who will never amount to nothing. Wow, double negative goes crazy there. By this point, everyone is silent and even the owner is coming over. An older woman from another section, who Lucy has never seen before either, gets up and comes over. The woman, who I'll call Belle, taps Karen on the shoulder. Karen stops her to raid, whips around, her face turning 50 shades of red and purple and stares Belle down. What do you want? Now, Belle is really calm here. You're going to apologize to this young lady, pay in full and leave a generous tip. Who the frick are you? Someone who can make things very difficult for your husband. I don't have to stand for this. She grabs her purse. I'll tell so many people just how much this place sucks that nobody will want to come here anymore. Karen storms off pushing the owner hard enough for him to fall to the ground and she left. According to Lucy, it was so silent that you could hear a pin drop for at least a minute. Belle helps the owner to his feet, makes sure he's okay, then turns to Lucy. Are you okay? Lucy is still shaken. Thank you. I'm okay. I'd like to apologize on behalf of the base. That was completely uncalled for. Belle then turns to the owner. I'd also like to compensate for the meal and tip as an apology. There's no need, mom. I insist, said Belle. Well, thank you, mom. Belle returned to her seat and the night continued. Belle and her husband came by to check on Lucy before leaving and promised to come back for dinner the next Friday. It wasn't until Monday afternoon when Kyle went to the restaurant to apologize that Lucy learned what went down. Now remember guys, Kyle is this horrible Karen's husband. Well, it turned out that Bell was the major general who had just been posted to the base. That morning, Bell had summoned Kyle to her office for a little chat. Because it happened off base, he was mortified and offered to reimburse Bell for the check and tip. He didn't get into trouble. However, he was warned that Karen's behavior could make things difficult for his career. He made sure that Karen got a verbal torn up one side and down the other on the phone when he was done. In this town, gossip spreads faster than the flu. Karen never darkened the door of the restaurant again, but the rest of the town made sure Karen knew she wasn't welcome. Belle kept her word and showed up every Friday evening for dinner with her husband. According to Lucy, she was a classy lady, and even if she didn't sit in Lucy's section, she'd make sure to tell Lucy hello and leave her a nice tip. Honestly, people like this Karen are just the worst. It's not even them, right, that is in that position of power or would kind of be able to flex a role. Not that I would ever say that's a good thing if you're saying, do you know who I am? You know, like, this is my job, this is who I am, etc. You should never do that, obviously, and people who do do that are terrible, but she's not even that person. She's the wife of that person. It's not even her that's like achieved that or has that role to sort of chuck around if they really want to, if they were 
super arrogant and egotistical anyway. Like, no one cares. It's not even you. It's your husband. <laughs> Crazy stuff. We'll say shout out, Belle, though. Um, doing a good thing. Making sure that everyone is, is settled. But yeah, as for this woman, <laughs> absolute mug. And um, I hope she gets chased out of town. Honestly, I, I've never actually had someone say to me, do you know who I am? But if someone did say that to me, I would say, first of all, are you Ronnie Pickering? Second of all, no, I don't know who you are and I don't care. And then even if they are, like obama i would still say i honestly don't care what relevance is that to this situation i really hope that situation does actually happen one day to be fair and barack if you are watching i would love to meet you but that is what i would do so uh, yeah prepare yourself for that mr president my mum is insistent that i have a c-section so that she and my dad can schedule their visit for the birth of my daughter i don't know where to begin I just need a place to vent. I, a 31-year-old woman, am due to have my first baby in just over five weeks' time. My pregnancy was a surprise, and it's been a difficult eight months thus far. Although low risk, I've experienced every symptom you can imagine from intense morning sickness to migraines and carpal tunnel syndrome. I've also faced some pretty intense discrimination at work, despite maintaining a high rate of performance throughout the year. All of this to say, it's been a rough year. I've had little support from my family this year, and their nonsense has seemingly known no bounds. Since around May, they've been asking my partner and I to make the 10-hour drive interstate for Christmas so that we could spend it with them. This would be fine, but my doctor has repeatedly told me not to do this as I'll be 36 weeks at that point and prone to blood clots. Despite this, they've continued to pester my partner and I about it. At one point, they proposed coming to us for Christmas, but then swiftly shut down their own idea when they immediately realized it would be an inconvenience to them. Recently, my dad was diagnosed with some health problems of his own, which he's been told is completely treatable with surgery and some medication. Regardless, I have called every other day to check up on him and to see how he's going. In the last few weeks, my mum has started telling me how awful birth was for her and every other woman on both sides of my family. I kid you not, every time she calls, she encourages me to plan a C-section and drop some new detail about a relative who had a traumatic birth experience. I have told her that her comments are unhelpful and she's known for months that I don't want a C-section if I can help her. She constantly says things like, if I had my time again, I'd plan a C-section, as if it's an easier option. I wondered why she started down this path until she started making comments about dad's treatment plan and appointments, such as, we might be able to make it out to see you for a few days in january but dad might have to go to an appointment on the 18th and then again on the 31st and then after that we can't visit for a while because dad might need surgery i snapped and told her that i would not and could not plan the birth of my child around their schedule and that they shouldn't bother coming they haven't even asked my partner or i if we even want extended family present directly after both we don't I was so scared about the birth and was starting to feel somewhat comfortable with the idea of it all when my mum started making these comments. Every time I've told her that I'm upset about their comments or their lack of normal healthy support, my mum has told me that I'm just hormonal and that everyone else has their own thing going on. I'm so sick of their trash and I'm ready to cut them off for some time. I feel like they've made the birth of my little girl all about them. They've compared the potential surgery my dad might need to my birth talking about catheters and iv drips like i won't need a similar setup particularly if i do go down the c-section routes when they did come to visit earlier in the year they made comments about what i was eating i was 24 weeks pregnant at that point one of my unhealthy options was a few chocolates after dinner i don't even know what to say or do all of this has made me reflect on my childhood and i can't help but feel sad about that too I've spent the last few weeks just crying about it all and I'm so tired of venting about it to my partner. Thanks for reading if you've come this far. I just needed to vent. Absolutely incredible. That's all I can say. Just want to start the episode. The one thing you have to do is do not tell your mum when the baby is born. You've got to wait. You just have to. It's actually insane. I mean, if you are genuinely trying to to plan a pregnancy date or say yep i want to have my c-section at this time so i know this person can come and oh do you mind pushing it back one day just so my husband can come as well just so he can be there i mean of course it's ridiculous but it's also bordering on unsafe for the child right i mean what what if the child had to come out the baby had to come out at a certain point or had an optimal due date but 
your mum was like, nah, can you just push it back a week or so so we can get there? Surely there are probably some health implications there. I don't know. Obviously a crazy, crazy demand that I don't think you will give into. But uh, yeah, make sure you don't please OP. My cousin sends our family her child's Christmas list each year. And it's completely insane. Every November, I, a 24-year-old woman, receive a dreaded text in our extended family group chat from my cousin, who's a 35-year-old woman. The text includes a highly detailed Christmas list from her five-year-old, who we'll call Penny. The items are always expensive, obscure, and very hard to find. Additionally, she expects us to reply with the item we have purchased, then sends back the updated list with that item checked off. Each year, there's exactly the number of items for people in the chat, and once people hurry to claim the cheapest ones, you're left with $100 to $300 items to choose from. My cousin is an only child, and her mum caters to this, as well as her dad, but the rest of us are getting pretty sick of it. Last year, someone didn't follow the list and said they'd already bought something else in the group chat. And she responded, that isn't what Penny wants this year, which made them feel guilty for not adhering to this insanity. Now, some backstory. Penny has autism, is nonverbal, and is the sweetest child ever. My cousin and her husband are good parents for the most part, but they are a little self-focused. For example, they are both collectors of things like manga and toys, and they lose their minds if Penny touches their things, and the home is full of their collections. They have an entire room dedicated to this, which they call the fun room, which their daughter isn't allowed in. Not so fun. Now, here's the kicker. The items on the list are almost always part of a collection. Either vintage, certain edition this or that, and tons and tons of Beanie Babies. They've started a toy collection similar to their own for Penny, but it's a lot of things that I've never seen her enjoy or show much interest in. One year, the most excitement she showed was for the box, and she loves Disney movies and Paw Patrol, but she's never gotten gifts related to these things. Also, we suggested some gifts like a toy kitchen or something interactive and sensory, and they shut that down in favor of expensive Lego Star Wars. Lego, she's five. I know dang well that's going straight to daddy's fun room. This year, I'm getting her an aerial doll and matching dress. I'm stopping the madness. Yeah, to me, it sounds like either your cousins are pretty much creating a fake Christmas list for stuff that they actually want, or they're just not listening to their child at all. I mean, maybe it's both. How about that? I've got to say, though, what you've said at the end is phenomenal. That's what you have to do. Just say no. It's time. Just say no. Get her what she actually clearly wants. To be honest, I genuinely kind of blame all of you lot a little bit as well. How have none of you put your foot down yet and just said, no, we're not spending $100 to $300 on a five-year-old as well? Like, come on. You guys also have to have a bit of a backbone. Ultimately, nobody can force you to buy presents. And yeah, I'm sure you would love to buy something that is on a genuine list or on a list that's given to you, but come on. If these parents have created a list with the number of presents adding up or, or you know, relating exactly to the number of people in the group chat, that is... Come on, I had the audacity of that. And then to charge what? Or to ask for presents in the hundreds of dollars for a five-year-old? You've got to say no way earlier. But at the very least, do it now. Now for our third entitled parent story. My mum has claimed the spare room in our house as her room. She doesn't actually stay here much, but I freaking hate it. We've always had this weird power struggle over my home and her staying there. I really don't think she's trying to be cute, but actually trying to establish her power over me by stomping on my boundaries. She's only stayed over a couple of times. We don't live in the same city, and I've corrected her each time she refers to it as hers. I say, it's not your room, it's the guest room. I kind of thought we were past this song and dance, as the previous to last time she stayed, she didn't say it. So I let my guard down, stupidly. Then the latest time she stayed over, as I was carrying her things into the room for the night, she quickly mutters, it is my room, isn't it? Nobody else has stayed in here. It caught me by surprise, so I didn't correct her this time. And besides me and my husband, that is technically true. But that doesn't mean she has ownership over it either. Then, just yesterday, she asked if she could stay over later this week. As I'm checking my calendar, she slips in a my room phrase. So I corrected her. It's not your room, it's the guest room. To which she stuck out her bottom lip in a pout and whines, is my room i start to repeat myself and she just talked over me before i could finish about did you know where your roaster is the one i got you for blah 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 yes i do know where that roaster is 
It's in the closet of the guest room. So now I interrupt her and demand, why were you in that closet? And she proudly boasts, I was snooping. I actually don't really care she went in there, but the way she proudly boasted about it really rubbed me the wrong way. And given the timing of it, it felt a lot like she was trying to hold more power over me when I was trying to establish my own boundaries. I will absolutely be telling her that in no uncertain terms will she be calling it her room again. If she does, it will be the last time she stays in it. But I just wanted to rant about it. Yeah, at this point, you know that your mum is just doing this on purpose, probably to try and rile you. I mean, to be fair, I don't know exactly why she's doing it. It's not the biggest of deals, really, calling a random guest room your room. And she is your mum. But doing it over and over again and you saying, please, could you actually stop doing that? It's not your room. It's a guest room. It's annoying. Yet her continuing to do that, yeah, that is entitled. And her feeling as if she owns or perhaps always has first dibs on a room in your house, obviously not true and yeah, ridiculous. I mean, the easy thing to do would just say you can't stay over anymore, but she is your mum. So I think that's a little bit too much of a, of a unrealistic answer or solution. I guess you could make the room into something else like a games room or something. But then again, you probably do need a guest room. Just tell her to shut up, honestly. I know she's a mum, but just shut up. Now for our final entitled parent story of this episode. My parents want to give my sister the earrings my grandma left for me. This story is so weird. When I, a 27 year old female, was 20 years old, I was in a relationship slash FWB situation with a guy who's now 40. It was messy. We were on and off for almost five years. He was always clear he wasn't ready for a relationship and I was always clear that I was madly in love with him. Every time I got tired of the situation and wanted to leave, somehow he convinced me to stay because love is free. We'd spent so much time together, but he wasn't ready to commit. I asked my sister for some advice. She's now 42 and she gave me some terrible ideas like make him compromise, leave stuff at his place and basically turn him into a boyfriend until it was too late for him to say no. I never managed to do that because I wanted him to love me as much as I loved him, not trap him. During the last night I spent at his place, he said he wanted to try something more serious with me. He talked about some dates that he planned, etc only to ghost me forever. It was hard. This was the first person I loved and he treated me like trash. Six months passed and one day my sister came home. We both lived with our parents saying she wanted to introduce her brand new boyfriend. She'd had a ton of boyfriends before, but she said that this was the one. It was a dinner only with my parents at our home. So I was excluded and expected to just go out or chill in my room. The day came and while they were eating, I ordered a pizza and came downstairs only to find the guy that I was with six months prior dining with my parents and sister. I was shocked, but I paid for my sister and went to my room to cry. After dinner was over, I confronted my sister in front of our parents and begged her to not be with him, to be loyal to me, her little sister. There was no way she didn't know who he was. I'd showed her pictures of him, his social media, where he worked, and she even knew where he lived. They never met because he didn't want to meet my family and never introduced me to his, but she knew who he was, and she excluded me from that dinner because she knew. She said they met by chance after we stopped seeing each other. But she knew how hard that rupture was. She knew how painful it was to not even have closure. He just stopped replying. He didn't even block me. He just left me there wondering after five years. She knew that during those six months, I was still hurting. I know that it was my fault. I was too naive and thought that if I stayed long enough, he would be ready for the relationship I wanted and would learn to love me. Stupid, I know. She defended herself saying it was a coincidence and that chemistry was there. She loved him and she wasn't going to lose the love of her life. This stuff only happens once in a lifetime? When I was in my early 20s, I would have believed that. But now, I know that there are 8 billion people in this world. There's no one love of your life. You can find the love of your life multiple times if you look for it. My parents sided with her and said I should get over it since we never had a real relationship. Now skip forward one and a half years. I've been excluded from multiple family gatherings because he would be around and my family thinks I will bring negative vibes since I'm still bitter about everything. I have no feelings for him, but I feel betrayed by my sister and my parents. He's just a POS in my eyes now. My sister is now six months pregnant. Due to her age, she'd been extremely pampered by my parents. She still lives at home and is going to move in with him maybe two months after the baby is born. 
then they're going to marry in my culture It is normal that when a woman gives birth She moves back or stays with her mum So the mum can help with the baby for the first few months a week ago My sister's friends had a surprise baby shower for her I happened to be at home and I tried to talk to them. I don't know why. Maybe because my sister and I were close before and I'm sad that we're no longer friends. But her friends acted like I wasn't there and only replied to me with, hmm, yes, no, or silence. As if I was the one that created this mess. Or I was a homewrecker. Or I tried to seduce my sister's man. I was planning to move already. I was saving money, etc. But after that, I left immediately to a friend's house. I'm now in the process of finding my own place. Two days ago, I received a call from my parents asking me to talk. I went to their house and they informed me that the diamond earrings my grandma left me will be given to my sister. Those earrings have been in my family for four generations. And before my grandma died, she said the earrings will be mine and my sister will receive a gold necklace. Grandma trusted my parents with the earrings. There was no will or anything. She just asked them to give it to me when I was mature enough to appreciate or take care of a family heirloom. Now my parents think that since my sister is getting married first and is having grandma's first great grandchild, my sister should have it. I'm really mad now. They're robbing me of something my grandma left to me. Look, I don't think my parents are evil evil. I think they were too worried that my sister wouldn't marry due to her age. Again, in my culture, a single woman in her 40s is something of a worry for her family. And now that she's forming a family, they want to reward her with everything. But I was the closest to my grandma. She made it clear the earrings will be mine, not my sister's. Not the first one to marry or have a child, but mine. After two years of being excluded in favor of my sisters, I gave the ultimatum to my parents that they give the earrings to me as my grandma intended, or I will cut them from my life forever. Well, there you go. I mean, to be fair, if you feel like it's come to that point, OP, then maybe that is the right thing to do. It's a terrible thing to suggest. And yeah, it's probably going to be really hard for you, even though these people, I mean, objectively sound pretty ridiculously unfair and and biased towards your other sister. Look, if this is what's going to make them actually understand and realize that you exist and they can't just treat you like this, then uh, yeah, maybe you've got to do it. The really tough thing with the earrings in particular is because there's no will, I guess they're not legally yours, even though they are. But if you've got no proof that your grandma actually said this about the earrings or, or said to you in particular that they're yours, it is a tough spot. And ultimately... Like, what can you what can you do other than just understand how terrible your entire family is, your sister and your parents, that is, and just say, well, yeah, I don't want a relationship with them anymore. Just because your sister isn't married by 40, we're going to have to protect her and give her loads of things and then treat her younger sister horribly ridiculous entitled mother-in-law can't believe she might need to pay for her own housing i just want to vent i've been with my husband for about 15 years and we were very low contact with his family for most of it because he couldn't stand them i probably only met his mum three to four times even though we lived in the same city well two years ago we get a call from adult protective services She was in the hospital after calling 911 and when they'd gone to get her, the apartment she shared with her daughter, who was also an entitled POS, that's a whole other story, was in such bad condition that they didn't want to release her back there. I'm sure they were happy to find someone else to take her, so we almost didn't even question whether there were other options and we agreed to take her. We moved her in. It's been a nightmare. She is very entitled and narcissistic. She doesn't have much income because she hardly ever worked, so it's pretty measly social security. She spends about half her monthly income on cigarettes. We so love smelling it all the time. She does smoke outside, luckily. When we first got her and she was pretty frail and it was winter, we let her smoke in the garage, which was a huge mistake and turned into a giant tantrum when we finally put a stop to it. Luckily for her, she gets Medicare fully paid for by the state and gets some food stamps, but we don't charge her anything. She is a total slob. She's probably taken five to six showers in two years. Oh my gosh. And we really resent having her here now. She never cleans after herself, makes noise constantly, and frequently acts like a child and throws tantrums. For instance, she ran out of a chocolate muffin she likes, but still had cake and other snacks. She huffed and slammed the pantry and said, I guess I'll just have to go without as usual. We make sure she gets all her meds, gets food even if her food stamps run out, and drive her to all medical appointments. Some are 90 miles away and take four hours. But yeah, 
she goes without. I wish we'd tried to find an alternative earlier, but we are finally trying. Today, I took her to meet with a social worker about Section 8 housing. She made it off the waiting list and we're waiting to see how much she might get and whether we can find her a studio or something. The lady explained that she would have to pay 30 or 40% of her income towards the rent. My mother-in-law started complaining immediately how they were going to take all her money. I'm just sitting here like, female dog, you live in my house for free. Why shouldn't you have to pay something towards your own basic needs such as housing? What the frick? Yeah, I mean, you've done the right thing. Again, like the first story, maybe it's a little bit less tough this time because it's not a child or a young baby that you're dealing with. It's actually an old person who is just a terrible narcissist. But still, you've done the right thing. You've done well, by the way, to, to have a look into Section 8 housing. Not that I know anything about that, but I'm, I'm English. And uh, yeah, it looks like you're on the right path to her moving out. Why is she complaining? I mean, come on. Does she not like look in the mirror sometimes when she wakes up? Or maybe after having one of her, I was going to say quarterly showers. It's not even quarterly. It's every like four months. So, so ridiculous. But every four to five months, it's five to six times every two years. Ridiculous. But does she not look in the mirror and think, what am I actually doing here? Leeching off my children and just not actually contributing anything to my own life. Do I try and sort it out? Well, no, she's entitled. Simple as that. Okay, now for our last, but by no means least, entitled parent story of this episode. I'm taking my mum to court. My mother has finally pushed me too far. I, a 34-year-old woman, cut contact with her back in 2021. She's always favoured my son, and he became her golden child. So she started trying to use the school to see him without mine or his father's permission after I cut her out of our lives. We quickly put a stop to it by speaking with the school and my son's father sent her a lengthy text telling her to never manipulate the school system to get to our son again or we'd be taking legal action. And he let her know that we'd spoken to the school about this and they were very aware of our feelings. She was mostly quiet for a while after that, but I caught her following me once and I evaded her. She even traveled to another state where my son's father's family vacations almost every year during Christmas. Luckily, my son happened to not be there that year. Well, recently, she started secretly volunteering at my son's elementary school. He's 10 years old, by the way. She lives over an hour away and didn't tell the school she had any familial connections there since she knows that we'd spoken to the school about her antics a while back. We assume that she lied about her address to get approved since she lives so far away. Anyway, she somehow snuck out of the classroom she was volunteering in and asked another child to get my son out of the cafeteria and spent 15 minutes crying to him, telling him how unfair I've been and that she's never done anything wrong that she has years of presents for him and he needs to come over to her house so he can have them. Worst of all, she told him not to tell anyone that she spoke with him or that he saw her. I felt like my mum was slowly calculating a way to eventually take him from the school. Now, my son's father and I aren't together, but we immediately banded together at this moment and spoke to the school vice principal the next day and we decided to file an injunction. The temporary injunction was approved within an hour of filing. I was immediately in tears. I was so relieved. Our hearing is coming up and the closer it gets, the more I find myself questioning what I'm doing. I know that I'm doing the right thing, but this situation just sucks. No one should have to protect themselves or their children from their own parent or grandparent. It's such an awful feeling. I wish she would have just respected our boundaries, but she's clearly incapable of that. I tried so hard to make her understand my boundaries before I cut contact with her. Her entitlement to my son was disgusting. She demanded seeing him, talking to him, and got very nasty and angry with me if I didn't oblige or if I had other plans and couldn't fit her in. She would constantly slip and call him her son. I guess I'm triggered and back to childhood me, feeling helpless and scared. I feel bad that I've had to go this far. I feel terrible that she's been served. I know I shouldn't feel bad because she's probably more embarrassed than worried about how this makes her look more than anything. It's probably a long shot, but have any of you guys experienced anything like this? I've never been to court. Even when my son's father and I divorced, we were able to settle on our own. I've got no idea what to expect and I'm scared. I don't want to see her. I don't want to hear her lie in court or cry and manipulate, but I know it's coming. This situation 
is heartbreaking. Well, there we go. I think I've saved the most entitled person of this entire episode for last, but with good reason, because there's a beautiful update coming that I'm going to get into in just about 12 seconds. Count them down. And uh, I think it just shows the beauty of Reddit and what an amazing place it really is. Just full of wholesome people. Has that been 12 seconds? I'm going to say yes. How did he do that? Edit. I'm trying my best to respond to each one of you, but I just have to say thank you all so much for sharing your stories, for guiding me, for giving me pointers, for helping me prepare, for keeping me grounded and rooting for us. I didn't expect to receive so much amazing advice and I'm crying tears of pure gratitude for each and every one of you. You guys might be strangers, but I love each of you from the bottom of my heart. Just know that you've all played a major role in possibly saving my son's life, maybe even my own. Once I have an update, I will edit this post again and let you guys know how it went as quickly as I can. There we go. The beauty of Reddit and the community that it brings right there in one paragraph. Lovely stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, you might think that's a little bit dramatic, a little bit of hyperbole there. But realistically, I mean, she is literally stalking your son. What else could she do? She could easily abduct him. I, I, I think she's shown that potential. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not really an exaggeration, is it? People have read it who, who have given this user, you know, real support and real tips and advice and and maybe pushed her into to gain this injunction in the first place or helping her deal with go to court, genuinely could have saved slash could be in the process of saving her and her son's life. Now, at the time of recording, we don't have an update. This was just posted two days ago, so it's a very fresh story. But let me know if you want me to look out for the update of this, if one does come. I'll keep my eyes glued to this account. And uh, yeah, if you want to see what happens next, Comment down below. My sister-in-law is stealing from me and using her baby as an excuse. My sister-in-law, Jessica, who is 29, and her husband, my brother, Liam, who is 32, are staying with me, a 27-year-old woman, and my wife, who is 30, due to foundation troubles at their own home. Simply put, she's been an absolute nightmare when it comes to taking things that aren't hers and brushing them off because she needs them due to her baby, my nephew, Liam Jr., who was three months. I'll just list the worst of it, but do note, this is a very condensed list. First, she took my expensive hair products made specifically for thick hair because, and I quote, Liam Jr. can't handle strong scents, and yours are just gentler on his nose. She used an entire 16-ounce bottle of conditioner in three days. Second, I caught her trying to take the food I ordered for everyone into her room after it was delivered. I ordered almost six full meals to dish out for the entire house and she was just holding this large paper bag in her room. She told me she was just sorting through it to find her food, but she was sitting down with chopsticks and the door was closed, so I call BS. Three, all of my snacks. My pantry has a shelf labeled specifically for me due to a mild food allergy that has all the snacks that I bought. I keep seeing her walking back and forth past my room with my snacks. If my wife or I try to confront her, she cries that she's breastfeeding and she needs the energy. Then she'll get my brother to chew me out. For the record, we do have a communal snack bin, but she won't touch the snacks in there. 4. She took my gift card stash from my shelf in the kitchen and spent nearly $75 on random BS because she claims she wants to make the room more comfortable for Liam Jr. I use those gift cards when I go shopping or as presents for sudden events. She knows this and still took six to eight gift cards out with her. It's been non-stop for the last three weeks and I'm so freaking done with her. She's taken my hair ties, my shirts from the laundry, my sleep bonnets and my lipstick. She even took a bottle of my apple cider gummies, which I know she doesn't like because she's tried them before. Wow. I feel like she's doing it just to spite me or to assert herself, but I'm seriously considering kicking her out. Yeah, exactly what I was going to say. This just feels like it's just to spite you right now, OP. No other reason. Now, we do have a couple of edits and updates on this one. Firstly, OP just wants to clarify that Jessica used her shampoo on herself, not on Liam Jr., because the smell was, I guess, irritating him. Also, I'm just going to state that the only reason I'm letting these two stay is because of Liam Jr. My brother can't afford housing close to his job, and if I kick him out, Liam Jr.'s housing would be up in the air. His commute is already 45 to 60 minutes each way, and none of our relatives who are willing to let him stay live any closer. Secondly, please do not insult my wife in the comments. She was recently promoted and isn't home often, but I assure you she sticks up for me when she's home. 
She has told me that she's willing to let them stay for Liam Jr. But she has shown that she's upset by Jessica stealing. I'm sorry I didn't say that before. All right, edit three slash small updates. I've been reading through the comments during my work break and I keep seeing the same things being tossed around. Even the comments that were harsh with it are right. Jessica stomped on both mine and my wife's boundaries using her son as a cover and I am being spineless by letting her stay. I also have to accept that Liam Jr. is not my responsibility. As much as I love him, I can't let his mum use him against me. I talked with my wife on her phone today and we've decided that we're telling them to start seeking alternative housing. We're also going to get a proper eviction drafted up. We've decided they have until Friday the 17th at the absolute latest. Now, this was posted on the 11th of February. So that's just six days from the time of posting. I will update after we've talked. Thank you all for knocking some sense into me. Yeah, you know what? I completely agree with the comments. It's tough, but Liam Jr. isn't your responsibility and you have to respect yourself and your wife now for the next juicy update we had the talk with them about an hour ago and it went bad fast my brother was screaming jessica was screaming liam jr was crying because of all the noise and somehow that's my fault they yelled for a good 40 minutes about how they had nowhere else to go and they won't be able to stay together if i kick them out it was hard for me but my wife helped me with my stress some highlights from jessica's rant include You can't have a baby. You'll never know how stressed I am. You didn't lose anything super expensive. Why are you acting like this? And my personal favorite, if you kick us out, you'll never see me or my son again. Along with a healthy bit of cursing. I told them that my wife and I's decision was final and Jessica locked herself in her room with Liam Jr. My brother tried to apologize saying that he was just stressed from work and his new baby and Jessica putting pressure on him but my wife cut him off and told him to imagine how stressed I'd been when my things went missing. He just kind of slumped in his seat, then went and joined Jessica in the room after I denied his pleas to stay again. I heard them arguing for a bit, but only for around 15 minutes. I got a text from Jessica's mother asking what was happening, but it wasn't hostile, so I don't think she has the full story. I'm debating telling her since she's technically not involved yet. I've gotten three or four similar messages from numbers I don't recognize, So I think Jessica may have told people my number or posted something. I'll update again if anything else serious happens. But here we go. Immediately, we do get this update. Jessica and Liam woke me and my wife up by clambering around about 20-ish minutes ago. They didn't say much while they packed up their stuff. But Jessica did say, I hope you're happy now. Don't expect to see Liam Jr. anytime soon. Wow. So I guess they did actually leave. I didn't feel good when they left. I felt awful. My stomach was in knots and my chest was burning. I should feel happy, but I don't. All I can do is worry. I just feel useless. I feel like a useless wife, like a useless aunt and sister. I was trying to help and now I might not see my nephew again. I went out of my way and now it feels like I'm being punished. I'm pretty sure they'll try something again, but it's not my concern anymore. My brother left his spare key in the kitchen but I'm still changing the locks. Jessica texted me that Liam is going to be staying in a motel near his job till they figure something else out. And she is going to be stuck with her mother. Her mother lives four hours away for reference. You were all right that I needed to have them gone, but I wish I didn't feel so dang bad. My wife has been comforting me as best as she can and I appreciate her so much. She's been so supportive and I'm lucky to have her. Thank you all for listening, commenting, etc. It was the extra push I needed to knock my stupid head on straight. Now you might be thinking that's the end of it, but no, we have another update. I was contacted by Jessica's mother who apologized for her daughter and offered to pay me the value of the item stolen if I let her and Liam Jr. move back in. Oh, it was all going so well until that last bit. I told her no, and she was surprisingly kind and accepting of this. The call was very short, but I can only assume Jessica told her mother some short or watered down version of what actually happened. I think though, that things are settling down now. I also got a text from my brother, but it only said that he was safe at the motel. And now the final update as it stands at the time of recording is this. Me and my wife have decided to send my brother a bill for the items Jessica stole. The exact number is a bit touch and go as we don't know the value of some items. We've added the items we're certain she took that can have a concrete price attached to them. We're going to send it tomorrow and I'll update you on what 
happens. Okay, and there we go. That is the first story of this episode. I've got to say that I do think you guys made the right decision. I'm not sure if, if the last bit is a little bit too petty or not. Like, don't go overboard, is all I'd say. They're gone now. Like, they've stolen stuff. It's annoying, but it's happened. Don't, like, you know, count up every penny or, or cent or whatever and, and give them a fully itemized bill. And I know a lot of you in the comments right now are probably disagreeing with me, and I understand that. I just think there's no need to be completely petty. Yes, you deserve the money, the majority of the money from, from the stuff that she stole. And yes, you should get that back. And to be fair, in a way, it was nice that her mum offered, even though it did come with that clause that you have to let them back into your home. But don't go through each individual item that she might have stolen. You're not entirely sure what the value is. But the main, the main thing is, yeah, send her a bill for that. But not every little tiny thing. Now, I will say, sadly, that this was posted 26 days ago, right? And as of today, the time of recording, 8th of March... You know, we haven't had anything. Now, this was posted on a throwaway account, so probably not this user's main. But hopefully they come back on at some point. I'll look out for it, guys. Don't worry. And they let us know exactly what happened, how much they ended up billing their sister for. If Jessica ever paid back the money, I kind of don't think she's going to, to be honest. So that's kind of why I'm saying that the, the, the invoice, the, you know, the bill doesn't really matter that much anyway. But yeah, we need to finish this story. I want to know what happens after that. I guess the point I'm making with the bill... It's just, is it worth the time to go through everything to make a bill that you know is not going to be paid anyway? Let's be honest, 99% she's not going to pay you back, given everything in the first place and the fact that she stole from you in the first place. Stealing from your own sister is mental. That's all I'm thinking. It's probably best just moving on from this now, forgetting about it, having the knowledge that you made the right decision, because I think objectively you did, even though you felt bad when they left. I think you did do the right thing. And yeah, as I said, just moving on with your life. My father demands an apology after 10 years of no contact. When I was 11 years old, my parents divorced. My father cheated a lot and my mother forgave him every time because she wanted to keep the family together. But then when I was 11, my father cheated again and ran off with this woman. What followed was a huge divorce with a lot of fighting and arguing. The only thing my father didn't want was us as children. It was decided that I had to go to my father at the weekends. Because where I live, divorces go through the courts and they think it's important that children continue to see both their parents. During these weekends, I was used more as a kind of Cinderella by my father and his girlfriend. And I was systematically abused mentally and physically. Every time I made a mistake in their eyes, didn't do something the way they wanted, didn't get things done on time because I had a lot to do, I was beaten with objects or just by hand. My father's favorite thing was his belt and my stepmother liked to use an electric fly swatter which gives off electric shocks when you turn it on so that you can kill the fly without crushing it, so to speak. If you hold it against your skin with the metal part, you'll get a pretty hard electric shock. To this day, I'm terrified of electric fly swatters, even though where I live, they are very common household things. I managed to hide the abuse for years by wearing baggy clothes with long sleeves, whether it was summer or winter. Because of this, I quickly became the weird kid at school and had no friends. The abuse had enormous mental consequences, but I wanted to persevere because I was afraid that if I stopped coming on weekends, my father's girlfriend would work out her anger on my little sister. She was only five when my parents broke up. I withdrew more and more to my room when I was with my mother so that I didn't have to talk to her. My mother is a sweetheart. She's really sweet and friendly and only wanted the best for me. She thought I was having trouble with the divorce and that I was starting to go through puberty. She regularly suggested that I go to a therapist, but I always didn't want to because I wanted to protect my sister. When I was 16, my gym teacher found out about the bruises because I suffered an injury during sports class and she had to look at my legs. As a result, child protection was immediately called to see that I was covered in them. My mother was so shocked that she kept me and my sister at home from that moment on. The judge decided that the contact arrangements were terminated and that we as children no longer had to visit my father. My father has always blamed me for the fact that he no longer sees his children. He called me a bad daughter and said that I should never have told anyone what happened in our home. He felt that it was no one's business and that it was good parenting, that it would make me hard and grow up to be a strong woman who could serve her husband in this way that if I behaved better and did what I was told, I wouldn't have to be beaten. 10 years have passed since then. Because of what happened and the fact that we lived in a small village, everyone knows what occurred and what he and his now wife did to me. I moved far away from them and cut off all contact. I went to therapy to learn to deal with everything. I have a very sweet partner who supports me and also helps me to overcome my fears that I developed because of my father. 
I regularly have panic attacks at home and I'm afraid of being home alone. We bought a video doorbell so I can see who is at the door without having to go to it because I'm afraid that he'll find out my address and come to see me. He's already tried to find out my address a few times through my sister since she has been in contact with him again for a few years. Her reasoning was that they've not done anything to her and they were always kind to her. So she sees no reason not to visit regularly. Hmm, that is interesting. Recently, I received a letter from my father through my sister in which he demanded that I apologize for my behavior and that because of me, the entire village thinks he is a disgrace. Yeah, I wonder why. In the letter, he said that he is getting older and his hearing and vision are getting worse. He demands that I apologize to him and that I introduce him to my partner, who really doesn't want that because he knows my entire history. He thinks he's been a good father and that being raised by my mother has made me soft and that I am now a bad woman because I'm pursuing a career outside the home in biology. My sister tells me that I should just say sorry and that he will really leave me alone afterwards. He really just wants to hear that he was a good father and that I regret talking to people 10 years ago when they saw my bruises. But I really don't want to. But my sister and father's family keep pestering me to say that I should just do it so that he can close it off and the village will no longer find him a shame. I really don't want to and I haven't slept at night because of it. I don't know what to do anymore and my partner tries to keep me calm so I don't have to think about it anymore because it gives me panic attacks. But my father and his family keep insisting and nagging me to do it by sending me messages on social media and calling or whatsapping me. I keep blocking them, but they create new throwaway accounts to reach me or give letters and messages to my sister so that she can give them to me. I didn't tell my mother about this because she already feels very guilty that she didn't notice the abuse for all those years. So, what do you think? Should I just apologize to get it over with? Absolutely not. Why would you ever apologize? I mean, this is such a sad story. You can't ever even think about apologizing. And to be honest, I think it's very tragic that OP is even considering it and it shows to me that the level of abuse that he suffered throughout his entire life. I mean, we know what physical effects it had, but mentally, the fact that you're in this situation and you're still even considering apologizing to your dad just shows the torture, the mental torture that you must have gone through and the impact it still has on you today. Like if I put myself in that situation, obviously, you know, objectively, and I haven't had all the all the abuse that you've suffered for all those years, I just say, straight off the bat no why would i ever apologize obviously he has to apologize to me and even then there's nothing he can even possibly say to excuse what he did for all those years but because you're in this situation and you've had to deal with this for so long and it's clearly had such an effect on you you're considering apologizing i don't know the worst person in all of this by the way i mean she's not the worst person obviously your dad and stepmom are but a close second slash third your sister what is she doing maybe she just doesn't understand maybe she was too young but i don't know i feel like she should be listening to you and just hearing what you did to to help her all those years ago and surely like if she hears about your experiences with her own dad and stepmom she would have to side with you but but no she's she's doing the opposite I don't know. Maybe it's because she was too young to remember. Maybe it's because your dad and stepmom are extremely manipulative. Maybe it's because she is a bad person. Maybe it's a combination of all three. I'm not sure. I just feel like you've been completely left on your own here, OP. And it's it's a good thing that your mum is is as sweet as she is. But my word, you know, three really bad people here. Now for our next entitled parent story. You called CPS because a toddler was running around naked. I was visiting with a very good friend of mine this weekend after a mutual friend's birthday party. We'd all gone, but it wasn't really a place conducive to quiet enjoyment of a friend's company. There was lots of noise and lights and sugary birthday goodies that everyone partook in, including my friend's two sons. Now, one of them isn't one yet, and the other is balls deep into the terrible twos. The answer for everything is no even when the answer was meant to be yes. It's hilarious, mostly because I can go home. My friend and his wife, they're tired, understandably so. So we were sitting in front of the TV and minding the boys while my buddy's wife wanted some time not spent in the immediate vicinity of her offspring, which honestly, fair. She got drove off in her car and went, I know not where, and we divided the labor equally. My friend had the kid who couldn't walk yet and they were curled up on the couch. I think the intent was for a quiet nap. Me, well, I was stuck with the two-year-old and we had beef. At one point in the birthday party, I was playing skee-ball at an arcade and offered my last ball to the two-year-old. 
He wound up like he was on a baseball mound and I wound up having to go no 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 and intervene He's yet to forgive me for this transgression So my charge for a little bit decided watching bluey was for suckers and he was going in search of adventure And I was following him around because that's what you do when someone places the welfare of their child in your hands The whole time he's sulking and glaring at me every time he realizes i'm still behind him It was so hard not to laugh because it was so overblown and dramatic So we're in the boys room and the kid i'm watching is currently trying to cram his little body under his bed and shouting about wanting mama Tough luck kid. Mama's taking a break. You're stuck with me And then there's a knock at the door. It's a caseworker from cps and a police officer I didn't realize this at the time as I was trying to make sure the kid's head wouldn't actually get stuck under the bed I'd never live it down My buddy answers the door and is rather alarmed to see the pair waiting there Then they came in and my buddy shouted for me to come back to the living room with the kid So I scoop up my charge and he starts squirming and squawking because he wanted to be under the bed And clearly this is not under the bed Matter of fact, this is the opposite and he promptly shuts up because strangers the caseworker goes on to explain that they've gotten reports about toddlers being left outside in the snow with only a diaper on being left naked to run around the house bruises on the kids etc etc for the uninitiated most toddlers cannot stand wearing clothes they want out of them immediately even the hint of a chance at ditching the clothing and they'll go for it the cop looks around for a moment says something to the cps worker and then leaves i sit with a two-year-old who was clothed by the way And my buddy does all of the talking i can tell that he is furious but i didn't really know why at the time the caseworker wanders around the house a little bit takes a look at both kids then shrugs and says he can't see any evidence behind the report but that everyone has to be investigated they'll be in touch but it won't be a home visit unless new evidence or reports come to light after the caseworker leaves my buddy hands me the not quite one-year-old takes out his phone and goes into the basement and promptly starts screaming at the top of his lungs into the phone. The one-year-old just went back to napping and the two-year-old showed some survival instincts. He just looked at me and said, daddy mad and watched TV with me and his brother. My friend's mother had some sort of mental illness flare up on her out of nowhere. I don't really know the details because it's not my business, but what little I did hear about was horrific enough. Evidently, on grandma's last visit, the two-year-old managed to escape the clutches of bath time and wound up making a beeline straight out the open front door into the snow. He realized this was a poor life choice seconds after escaping, mostly from face planting into snow after tripping, and struggled not at all to be brought back in for bath time. Why was the door open? Grandma's new boyfriend was rather drunk and attempting to bring in a pile of Christmas gifts that were arriving in late January. He fell down the stairs when he tried opening the door, so they just propped the door open to allow easier offloading. In a nutshell, stuff happens. Kids have minds of their own and do their own thing, He was never in any actual danger, just a two-year-old doing two-year-old things. The fact that grandma twisted the event in such a fashion honestly confuses me, especially since the root cause of the kid getting out at all wasn't even my friend's fault. The really fed up part about the report though, the reason there was a cop there was because grandma told CPS that her son was an alcoholic with a mean streak when he was drunk and that he kept a gun at the door. He does keep a gun by the door to be fair it's a double barrel shotgun and a small safe with a keypad because he lives in the boonies and it's not unusual to see things like bears to the best of my knowledge the only time the gun is fired is at range so my buddy and his wife can use the weapon competently if the need should arise her own son though now some parents can be difficult all right I hold my hands up. Some grandparents can be difficult. Some parents can be difficult. um, And, you know, not always is it a good idea to have your parent look after your child. I do feel like this is one of those occasions where maybe you don't let your mum look after your kid anymore. Um, I do, though, have to say that there's, there's levels to this game. Calling CPS on your own son. That is mad i don't really understand even why she did that okay sorry she didn't call cps someone else did but then sorry the the grandma saying that her own son was an alcoholic with a mean streak is absolutely mental that's the reason why the cop was there of course i don't know like it's bad enough that someone calls cps um i think yeah it happens you could say but also it's a bit it's not great i mean a two-year-old being able to run outside on their own it's very dangerous as we saw with a, a story not long ago you know a kid abandoned on their own outside can have serious repercussions but 
then yeah doubling down and saying oh actually no it's um because of my son who's an alcoholic mad and look i get it she has a mental illness does that excuse this does that allow for this i would say no obviously you need more context there but yeah i think the easiest thing to do is just you know, maybe you don't cut her off, but just don't let her ever look after your kid. Now for our final entitled parent story of this episode. My bio mum's husband offered to adopt me. I'm already adopted. I am 18, non-binary. I don't remember the exact ages of my bio mum and her husband, but they're in their late 40s. I'll call them Claire and Daniel. For some background, Claire had me and my brother while she was an addict and had a lot of untreated issues. Bipolar, BPD, schizophrenia, etc. I won't go into a lot of detail because it's very heavy, but long story short, she married a bad man. And because of his and her actions, she lost custody of us when we were five and we eventually got adopted when we were eight. She divorced that man and is now married to Daniel. Now onto the story. Claire at the time had gotten diagnosed with a terminal illness, so I had agreed to fly out there to visit her. I'd never gotten super close with Daniel, but we were relatively friendly. At first, the visit was okay. Everyone was acting normally. But then things kind of started to go downhill. Claire asked if I would consider moving out there for the time she had left, and I said I would consider it. She seemed to be happy with that answer at first, along with Daniel, but then it started going downhill. They started acting like I was definitely moving in, and started trying to make all of these decisions before I'd even decided, like wanting to go to the social security office to see if I still qualified for insurance, etc. It was hard for me to push back on it and set boundaries because I'm autistic and communication is hard, so I just kind of brushed it off. One night, me and Claire were having a deep conversation and Daniel joined in, which led to him offering to adopt me. I explained that I was already adopted and that I did not want to be adopted again and he seemed to drop the issue. Over the next few days though, he started getting more authoritative, I guess. Whenever I talked about something, he would correct me, even if he was obviously wrong. It even got to the point when I was trying to bond with him and talk to him about my trans experience, he straight up said that I should try to be comfortable being a woman and that he didn't want me to get gender affirming surgery, that I needed to fully experience being a woman before I decided. I deflected from the topic but felt very uncomfortable. When I flew home and told my mum everything, she texted Claire saying that she basically needed to take a chill pill and that Daniel needed to stop inserting himself in our lives like he was a parent. The last thing I heard about the situation is that when my brother visited later, Daniel told him something basically to the effect that I was influenced easily and that's why I'm non-binary. I haven't talked to him since besides saying hi when I'm on the phone with Claire. I mean, the strange thing is that your bio mom's husband doesn't already know that you're adopted. Unless he does know and he just wants to like re-adopt you or cancel the adoption that has already happened and take over. You know, like when a manager gets sacked, is he the new manager? Is he the caretaker manager? Is that what he wants to be? I think once again, it's, it's, it's been the case with multiple stories here. You just need to stay away from these entitled parents. That really is like the key thing. That is the common denominator throughout every entitled parent story ever realistically just stay away from them but uh yeah i think it's much harder when they are your own family i mean we also have to of course talk about the fact that he's saying oh yeah don't transition man uh well not man but you know what i mean don't transition you need to experience what it's like to be a woman what what is that i mean what is that At what age do you have full experience of being a woman that's my question and again it makes me think of an episode the other day where somebody said you're not a lesbian you just haven't had the right d yet it's along those sort of lines it's crazy now someone's actually commented down below that they have a creepy feeling it's not going to be adoption but actually a relationship especially with him not wanting you to transition now i don't know about that but then they've also said do you have an uncanny resemblance to your bio mum. So I guess this person is saying, once your bio mum passes away, he might want to get with you and replace her with someone that has similar DNA and looks similar. If that's the case, that is mental. I I wouldn't suggest that myself, but, oh, apparently actually just looking, OP has said that in the past, they've talked about their sex life to me, talked about their relationship. And when he was talking about wanting me to have the full experience of a woman, he was talking about the topic no one should be talking about with their wife's kid that they barely know. Okay, that's just, yeah, really, really creepy. Uh, I've had enough. Entitled mother showed up to my door and tried to break into my home. She assaulted me and I had to defend myself. Now she's making herself out to be the victim. So to get you all up to speed, I'm going to give you a rundown of my situation. 
I went no contact with my mother back in October. She threw a tantrum about her husband not being invited to my Halloween party. The reason he wasn't invited, he was abusive to me my whole life. He molested me for two years. He SA'd me. He was physically, emotionally, and verbally abusive as well. He's a sociopath. He doesn't give a dang about who he harms or anyone else's feelings. He's also a kiddie toucher. And that's why I'm protecting my child from him and my mum. I went no contact with my mother's husband two years ago almost. No contact in May 2022 when I found out I was pregnant and I moved in with my husband shortly after. My mother tried extreme methods to get her way. She sent me fake custody papers in the mail to try and scare me. Her husband came to my door yelling and demanding to see my daughter. He yelled, cursed, and kicked my door, which I got all of with my Ring doorbell camera. He was arrested by officers for not leaving and for threatening them. They had been nonstop trying to contact me. My mother even showed up to my husband's job and caused the scene. So that is the rundown of the whole situation. Now, my mother came to my door this morning when my husband just came back from his overnight shift at his job. She banged on my door and my husband answered it. For context, this situation was all as well caught on camera. I have cameras outside my apartment door and I have one in the house pointed at the door. My husband told her that she wasn't welcome here. She yelled at him and said, I want to see my daughter. She's been ignoring me. I am her mother. She has no right to treat me this way. I was instantly irritated. I told my husband to go to the back room with our child. I walked to the door and blocked her from getting inside. She was yelling and screaming at me like a crazy person. She threw a tantrum because she found out about my daughter's party and she wasn't invited. She said it wasn't fair. She demanded I let her in my house to see my daughter, who for some reason she calls her daughter. It's creepy and weird. She tried to bulldoze her way into my house. I tried to shut my door and she pushed against it. I was flung into the wall so hard it left a hole in our drywall. I had bruises on my forearm. I screamed at her to get out. She shoved me and I saw red. I punched her in the face so hard that she flew back. I managed to get her out of my doorway and we shut the door and locked it. My husband then called the police. She was arrested for assault and for attempted breaking and entering. Now she's telling everyone of my Facebook friends a fake sob story claiming that I assaulted her. Even with the camera footage of her assaulting me, she is still lying. I press charges. We're moving when our lease is up in April. We will be moving into a house with my husband's dad for safety reasons. Am I wrong for punching her? I really didn't want to punch her and I feel awful that I did. I was defending myself, but I still feel like it could have been handled differently. I need advice on moving forward and what other precautions I can take. You know what, OP? I don't think you're wrong at all for what you did. In fact, I think you're very, very right. It doesn't matter who the person is. If it's a complete stranger, if it's your grandma, if it's your mum, if it's your child. If they're trying to break into your house unlawfully without your permission and they are threatening you, I think you're allowed to defend yourself. And if it takes punching them in the face to to make them stop, then I'm all for it. Clearly, no contact is the best thing. I really hope that nobody on Facebook believes her sob story and that you and your husband can get a restraining order for the stepfather as well. Just make sure that people don't believe her is all I'll say. If it takes you having to go on Facebook yourself and message people individually, I think it's worth doing it. If you've got to send the footage, the the camera footage, to people, if you're allowed, that is. I don't know how it works with evidence. If you can, to prove your innocence, do it. I think you have to shame this woman that is, unfortunately, your mother. Entitled Kid tries sending his police officer dad after me in a pro-revenge attempt. His plan backfires. From the mid 90s through early 2000s, I've spent my summers working as a counselor at a Boy Scout summer camp. I've worked in several different program areas, but this story happened when I was the director of the rifle range. Every week we would get a new group of campers. And when they came up to the range for orientation, I would go over all the safety rules. I would finish by telling the kids, you all get one warning on this range. And this is the warning. There are only two safe directions to point your rifles up in the air or down range. It doesn't matter if your gun is loaded or unloaded. If you break this rule and deliberately point your rifle in any other direction, you will be kicked off this range and will not be allowed to shoot here for the rest of the week. I would go over all of these rules again for the kids on the first day of merit badge classes to satisfy the safety rule requirement for the badge. And there were plenty of posters hanging around the range with all of the safety rules on them. In other words, there were no excuses to break them. One day, the scouts in my merit badge class were practicing shooting for the test they had to take at the end of the week. 
One scout, the entitled kid of this story, thought it would be funny to point his rifle at another scout and spout off some random action movie line. I ran up and snatched the rifle from his hands and yelled, what the heck are you doing? The entitled scout responds, but, but, but the gun wasn't loaded. Recite the safety rules now. The entitled scout recited them all, including the part about pointing the gun in an unsafe direction. I told him to hand over his shooting ticket. I tore it in half and said he was done on my range for the rest of the week. Later that afternoon, the range was open for free shooting. Everything was going smoothly until I noticed the entitled scout walking up the trail towards the range with his father, an assistant scout master who was built like an NFL linebacker. After the round of shooting ended, I called a ceasefire and told my assistant to keep an eye on the range while I handled the situation that was about to happen. As I approached the entitled scout and his father, he jumped up and down, pointed at me and yelled, that's him. He's the one who tore up my ticket and kicked me off the range. You're going to get it now. My dad's a cop and you're going to be sorry for what you did. Before I could get a word out, cop dad gets in my face and started chewing my butt out drill sergeant style now this story happened so long ago that i don't remember exactly what cop dad was shouting i mostly remembered the poop eating grin the entitled scout gave me as he watched his father tear me a new one i just stood there quietly and patiently waiting for my turn to respond finally cop dad said something along the lines of so what do you have to say for yourself Yes, I did tear up your son's shooting ticket and I kicked him off my range, I replied. But did your son mention why I did that? Cop dad's face went from angry to inquisitive. He blinked in rapid succession as he said, No, no, now that you mention it, he didn't tell me why. We both turned our attention to the entitled scout. His smile faded and he shrunk in our presence as he realized that his plan had just backfired. I loved returning the same poop-eating grin that he gave me a few moments earlier. To the entitled scout's credit, he did tell the truth. He probably knew better than to lie to cop dad. And if looks could kill, the look on cop dad's face would have killed his son several times over. After a moment of silence, he finally said, in one of the most intimidating voices I've ever heard in my life, Go back to camp and wait for me at your tent. I'll deal with you soon. The entitled scout left to the tune of Dead Man Walking. Cop dad turned to me and apologized for getting angry and chewing my butt out before knowing all the facts, to which I accepted his apology. For the rest of the week, cop dad would come to the range every day during open shoot, shoot my rifles, and would hang out and talk with me. Turned out he was actually a pretty cool guy. At the end of the week, he told me that when they got home, he will finish his son's rifle shooting merit badge and he'll make sure that his son will never disrespect a firearm ever again. You know what? I actually rate this dad quite a lot. How many stories have we seen over the years now of entitled parents just doing exactly what their kid says or not even listening to to any other context or anyone else involved just saying, oh no, my angel is in trouble. Therefore, I'm going to completely take their side. But to be fair to this dad, once he actually learned the context of what had actually happened, he switched. Good man. I mean, let's be completely honest. This is very, very serious. It's a very, very serious situation. Even if the gun wasn't loaded. I mean, who really cares? Who knows, right? First of all, it definitely could have been. Second of all, it's just a terrible thing to do anyway. Especially given the fact that he knows the rules, but is just probably trying to show off. Yeah, his dad needs to let him know to never do that again. But once again, fair play to the dad for not just completely going crazy at you when you realize what had actually happened. Entitled ex-landlord demands I leave behind the washer and dryer I paid for. So for the past two years, I, a 25-year-old man, lived in a small apartment building. The apartment didn't have a laundry room for the building when I moved in, but it did come with hookups for a washer and dryer in the apartment. So I bought them myself because I work for a wildlife sanctuary and I get pretty dirty during my work. Just the other day, I had to chase down and wrestle one of our wild boars, Bacon. We didn't name him that, he came with that name. Who loves to escape his pen and thinks it's funny to play chase. I got completely dirty. I was covered in grass stains and mud, so I very much need a washer and dryer. My boyfriend and I just got engaged, and since my lease was up, I moved into his house with him. I finished moving everything out of my old apartment yesterday, and I thought nothing about taking my washer and dryer with me as I had bought them. My boyfriend also had some, but they were old and kept breaking down and just cost too much to have fixed. Well, I woke up this morning to multiple missed calls from my old landlord. I left my phone number and new address in case any mail was delivered to my old place. I called him back, And he asked me why the washer and dryer was gone. I explained that I took them with me. 
He started freaking out, saying that he'd put that the place had a washer and dryer in the ad for the place. Apparently, I have raised the rent due to having those. He started demanding that I bring them back because the new clients that he set up to move in had already signed the lease, but they're not interested in the place without the washer and dryer. He even threatened to call the police if I don't take them back. I got angry and told him that I would do no such thing, reminding him that they belong to me. I bought them and I still have the receipts from when I bought them, as well as a text from him when I moved, explaining that I was buying them myself. He again, though, threatened to call the police. I told him to do it and see what happened, and I hung up at that point. Personally, I don't think I'm in the wrong. I bought them and they weren't cheap, so I feel I have the right to take them. My boyfriend is on my side, but today a co-worker of mine said they think that I'm the jerk for not telling the landlord that I was going to take them. In my opinion, that should have been obvious. I pay for them, why would I leave them? Well, my landlord went through with calling the police because the next day they showed up. Honestly, nothing really noteworthy happened. I explained to them what was going on and I showed them the receipt for the washer and dryer as well as a text from the landlord that I had from when I told him I was buying them. The cops took my statement and left. My boyfriend's father is a lawyer and he's going to be contacting my landlord and sorting everything out. He advised me not to respond to said landlord anymore for the time being. Yeah, this is completely and utterly ridiculous. And to be honest, I actually understand why the landlord is so angry because he knows he's clearly effed up here. If he genuinely thought for some stupid reason that you were going to leave the washer and dryer, then it does make sense to advertise the place as having a washer and dryer. And then, yeah, you can probably raise the rent a little bit due to having those appliances. But why has he done that in the first place? It's so dumb. He's messed up so badly. Now he's realized it and he's coming after you just to try and intimidate you, I guess, into letting him keep the washer and dryer. But, you know, as you said, they are legally yours. You bought them with your own money. You can obviously do what you want with them and you have the receipts simple enough you shouldn't even need a lawyer here just you know you gave the police the statement and you showed them the receipts you're completely fine the landlord though is an absolute clown patient's boyfriend is mad that he has to pick up his own uber eats i work in a high level hospital as an icu nurse and my managers are fantastic with staffing meaning if you have a crashing heavy workload patient they'll make the other patient you have an easier one so you can focus on the sick one for background icu nurses have two patients and we specialize in critical thinking whereas the tele floor is the normal part of the hospital that people think about and holds less sick people who don't need as much attention so these nurses have six patients and specialize in tasks and prioritization. So the beginning of my shift after report, I show my face and say hi to my less sick patient who is doing fantastically and is just waiting for transport to take her to her telebed. I say I'll be back at around 9 p.m. in two hours unless she needs me for something. So this gives me time to stabilize the sick patient next door. Unfortunately, the sick patient in room one starts coding and the team is actively doing CPR crash cart in the hallway, three docs here, the whole team trying to save this young dude. My team is working on meds, intubating, keeping compressions going, etc. while I'm talking with doctors about what could have caused it. And I'm halfway outside the room for the healthier patient in room two. She sees me through the window, presses the cool light, and I ignore it because I have, what should have been obviously, very pressing matters. Her boyfriend ends up opening the door and standing in the doorway to just stare at me with his arms crossed. Just to give him the benefit of the doubt that she could be concerned about her health, I say, is everything all right? And he goes, hmm, and tries to lead me inside. Of course, I only pay attention to him when the docs go into room one to brainstorm on their own and assess where to go if we get the guy back. I look back through the window of room one and realize I can give them five seconds to make sure nothing funky is going on. So she says, can you get my Uber Eats order? It just said it arrived downstairs. I swear I could have had a stroke from high blood pressure at that moment. So I kindly say, I'm sorry, I'm busy with another critical patient. Could you? I looked at the boyfriend who's plopped in the recliner with his feet up, watching Netflix again on his phone. Go and get it for her? And he goes, I'd rather not. Oh, oh, good sir, you don't want to? You saw the mess next door through the window, me talking seriously with three docs and the hot mess of people outside your room as we try to save a dang life. So I tell him, I can't. The entire team is actively trying to save someone and none of us are available to leave. So either you get it or I can have someone get saltines for you instead. He sighs, gets up slowly and then says, fine, 
I guess I'll go get it then. As I turn to head back into room one. The dude literally has to turn his shoulders to slide through the massive group of people. Still angry, he has to take one elevator down. When they get moved to another room at around 10 p.m., he's speaking loudly on the phone to someone, saying things like the nurses are rude, they won't even get food for their patients, etc. The icing on the cake? She had just gotten off an insulin drip for being in a diabetic coma. Never met a more entitled person who put having to walk and get their own food delivery above someone else's life. Well, there it is. That is definitely the most ludicrous story that we've had on this episode so far. I mean, that is an absolute disgrace. I don't even care, right? And I, and I don't mean this in a rude way to the guy that was obviously in a very life-threatening condition. I don't care if somebody is in a life-threatening condition. You can't ask a nurse at any hospital ever to go and get your food for you that you've ordered. That is just so dumb. Even if they're dealing with, with just, you know, standard patients that are sick enough to be in hospital but are doing fine. Why would you ever ask a nurse to do that? Unless you are literally on your own with no one else around to help you and perhaps you've pre-agreed with them that you're going to order some food. Could someone go and get it for you? Ideally, not a nurse. Then it's fine. But if you've got someone there in the room as well and they can't be bothered to go downstairs and get you your food, what? What's the point? And also, why are they even there in the first place? Are they not there to kind of give you support, look after you when you're in hospital? Go and get your food, perhaps, that you've ordered? Who knows? Absolutely crazy. Get your comments down below for that one, guys. Just insane. Now for our final story of this episode. This one I'm looking forward to. Thanks to Reddit, I stood up to an entitled Karen. What a title that is. I've been following various communities on Reddit for a few years now. To name a few, r slash am I the jerk, entitled parents, and of course, r slash entitled people, as well as the website, not always right. Wondering if people like that really exist or if it was mostly creative writing. I also wondered how I would react if I ever witnessed something like that myself. Well, now I know. A few weeks ago on a bright Sunday morning, I was on my way to the zoo with my daughter who was two and my niece who was two and a half. I stopped by the grocery store for a picnic. I don't know what it's like where you live, but here foods and drinks and amusement parks and other places are far too expensive. Yes, that is true in England and America to be fair. I had the girls in the trolley and got in line to the cashier. The lines were long, but hey, life, right? The cashier was doing her thing while chatting with the clients and I was minding my own business talking with the kids and patiently waiting. Suddenly, I hear shouting and see an irate woman yelling at the poor cashier who was visibly getting more and more upset. The client, an older woman with no distinctive features, was yelling like a banshee because the cashier dared to wish a good day to the previous client and basically be nice and friendly. And because of that, our dear Karen was running late. Again, it was around 10.30 to 11 on a Sunday morning. FFS. That's when I remembered all those stories. Those poor workers who are basically not allowed to talk back and have to take the abuse. And I decided to intervene. I have a very strong voice that carries loud when I want to. I asked loud enough for the entire store to hear, what the heck is your problem? What kind of behavior is that? I think the Karen was not expecting someone to dare to stop her to raid. She recovered and tried replying. I stopped her and told her that she was the only one holding back the line and that the cashier was doing her job and doing it well. In the meantime, the manager had arrived and had replaced the cashier, who was crying, with another worker and came to ask what was going on. Karen starts again. I let her rant for a few seconds and then gave my version of what happened in the most calm and sane voice possible. Let me tell you, Karen was fuming and started complaining again about the cashier being slow because she was chatting nicely with the customers. By then, her grocery was finished being rung and the manager asked her to pay and leave. This might not be the best climax compared to all the other stories I've read here. And if you've read so far, I hope that if you also encounter this type of entitlement, you will also remember all these Reddit stories and decide to act. Thanks for reading mine. Well, there we go. If you thought that me reading out all these stories every day was pointless, then you're wrong, as we can see. A jest, of course, but you know, maybe maybe that is the learning from all of us here. You know, if you see someone that's actively doing or wronging someone and there's no reason for it, jump in. We've seen so many stories, again, over the years, where people haven't done that. And it's a shame, isn't it? Because just one little act of intervention, like we've seen here from OP, can, can have a massive, massive difference. 
Who knows? This woman, right, having a lovely day, this cashier, she could have really thought to herself, you know what, I'm done with this. If it's going to take just one person to ruin my day like that and cause me to cry, I don't want to do this anymore. But who knows? You jumping in may have made her thought, yeah, there are people like that that are always going to be in the world and are going to be horrible. But if the majority of people are lovely and like chatting to me, and then people like UOP will come to my aid and my rescue, when that does happen, maybe it's all good. And uh, we can just deal with these sort of people together. So yeah, you know what? I've learned a valuable lesson. Next time I see something like this, I'm getting involved. That is for sure. Entitled sister-in-law tries to take credit for large cancer fundraiser donation. So context, my mother has a friend that has terminal cancer. She got diagnosed about a year or so ago and it recently went terminal. She only has a few months left. So her friends and family decided to have a fundraiser in her honor to help cover medical slash afterlife slash bucket list costs, as well as help the family out after she passes. This lady is an amazing person. Everyone in town knows and loves her. She's a hairdresser and has been doing my mum's hair for ages. My mum has been a big part of the planning and fundraising for this event. There are a handful of this woman's friends and family taking part in it. However, most of them live an hour or so away. So the businesses and people they are getting donations from are not in our town and they don't know anyone. So my mum took it upon herself to call dang near every business in town. Family owned shops and restaurants, chain shops and restaurants, travel agencies, insurance agencies, big places of employment, etc., as well as donations from the general public. She even got our local Walmart to donate. She's gotten everything from small items, gift cards, whole baskets, massages, discounts. She even got our local airport to donate two 30 minute airplane rides around our country. That is phenomenal. And the latest place to donate was our bowling alley. The guy who runs and owns the place is amazing. He also coaches both our high school bowling teams. When my mum called him, he said that he's going to take a bit to think about what to donate because he wants to do something other than just a free bowl or two. He ended up ordering two new bowling balls and is donating them along with two one hour bowling parties for 10 bowlers. That's like a $400 donation overall, at least. So anyway, he told her last week when he called to confirm what he's donating to call back in a week today to check if it's in and if she can come and pick it up. She's been posting thanks on Facebook for the donators and telling them what they've donated to kind of give a peek at what the auction baskets will include. So she called today to ask if it's in and if and when she can pick it up. She was informed then that someone already had. My mum was not made aware that someone else was picking it up. She posted about the donation on Facebook and added in the group chat that they have for their friends and family. No one outside of that chat knew that she hadn't picked them up yet. So she messaged them all asking if one of them had grabbed it and forgot to tell her, but they had no clue what she was talking about. We thought maybe some jack wagon saw the post and decided to take it for themselves. I called the owner and asked if he knew who picked the stuff up and he said, Janet. He said that since she was family, he thought that we'd sent her. My mum texted the group chat asking if anyone knew who she was. And it turns out that she is the woman's husband's sister. The sister is not in any of the group chats and hasn't attended any of the meetings regarding the fundraiser or the planning. The woman's daughter is in the group chat and is very active in the planning and the fundraising. She called her mum and asked if she heard from the sister and if she's seen the bowling balls or certificates. And her mum said that the sister had actually brought them to her home, saying that she had got this huge donation from the bowling alley. Now, none of the other donations have been going to her house. We don't want to clutter up her house and cause her stress trying to help plan. So the friends and family have been keeping the stuff at their houses until it's time for the fundraiser. So there's no other reason for her to take them to her house other than to take credit for it. I just don't understand why she would take it upon herself to go and pick up a huge donation that she didn't take part in without telling my mother, the one who got the donation, that she didn't need to go and pick it up because she had it covered. She took it straight to the woman's house without asking the group that's planning where we're storing the donations. And she didn't tell anyone that she took it. She doesn't even live in our town. She lives 30 minutes away. So she had to go so out of her way to pick this up. She took it to her sister-in-law's house, trying to take credit for this huge donation when she hasn't put in a lick of work for this fundraiser and left us worried that someone else had just taken our donation and ran off with it. Honestly, after reading this, I kind of would have rathered it be someone just steal the donation 
and keep it for themselves. This, if anything, is worse. At least if someone went and just stole the donation, you'd say, you know what, that's a real shame. Isn't it so sad that these things happen and people out there exist? It's terrible. However, what the sister-in-law has actually done here is try to just completely devalue the entirety of your mum's work and the the number of other donations that have been made from, you know, a, an insane amount of people, it sounds like. If she is claiming this as her own, what does that then mean for everybody else who's actually done the work? Do you kind of get what I'm saying? So, yeah, although I'm sure you'll get the donation back and that's unbelievable. The fact that she has put this, like, doubt, perhaps, into the woman's mind, into everyone else's mind about who's actually raising the money or what's going on here. It's crazy. Like, it's it's so much more selfish than if some random had just stolen the donation in the first place. Like, she knows the level that your mum has gone to, like, the effort that your mum has put in to get these unbelievable donations, yet she's still done this. The audacity. Not just the program that I'm using to record this audio on right now, niche joke, but the audacity. Now for our next entitled people story. Friend invited me and husband to stay with her for a week. And then the day before we left, gave me an itemized list of all the things we did that I needed to pay for. Okay, look, I get helping to pay for some things when you're staying with someone, but I was just blown away when she gave me this rundown list for things we did. She was my best friend. I'd known her since I was eight and we're now 50. Sure, we've grown apart since then because now she lives in another country and I rarely see her, but she kept begging us to come and visit her and her husband. They'd put us up for our entire stay and even offered to throw my husband a 50th birthday party because we'd be there during his birthday. Quite honestly, if I invited someone to stay with me, there's no way I'd be asking for any money from them. I can't imagine doing that. I was going to give her some money for things like the room they paid for when we went to another city and stayed over, but there were other things that I was like, wow, really? But she didn't simply ask for some money. She actually gave me an itemized list of what I owed her. Half of everything we did. My best friend, and she listed things down to the dime of what we owed her. So here is the list. $152.10 for a stay at a hotel room in another city. Okay, this I get. $105 for gas for them driving us around town and out of town during our stay to show us the sights. $90 for birthday food for my husband's birthday party. This I get as well, I guess, but if you offer to throw a party for someone, you don't usually expect them to pay for half of it. Yeah, sorry, I disagree with you there, OP. I do not get that at all. They've offered to throw the birthday party. That's like they're offering to pay for it as well. That's kind of what that means, no? $136 on car rental when we flew to another island with them for a couple of days, I get this as well. All right, that seems reasonable. $21 gas, I guess for around town driving. Wait, so that's on top of the gas that they've already charged you for, what? $6.50 for parking, for freaking parking the car in the city for one day, really? And then $27 for airport parking, when we parked the car at the airport before taking a flight to the other island for two days, really? So in total, that is $537.80. I was just blown away by this. I would have given them a couple of hundred to cover the hotel room and birthday food, but actually asking us to pay for the gas to drive us around and parking is ridiculous. Especially the measly $6.50. And the fact that it wasn't just $500, but $537.80. They asked us to come visit, and then unbeknownst to us the whole time, they were tallying up all these things that we did to split the cost of everything. They came and stayed with us a few years earlier, and I certainly didn't give them a tally of the groceries they owed or the gas spent driving them around. You ask someone to stay with you, then you pay for things. I mean, what can I seriously add to what I've already said? It's just so painfully obvious. This is just not the way to treat someone ever. If you were inviting someone to stay with you, it's it's pretty much just kind of a given that everything is on you, right? Now, a nice person in that situation would definitely offer to pay for things and would pay for things. I think that's accepted. You know, at least pay for a nice meal out or, or pay for a trip somewhere or whatever. Contribute to, to what you're doing, the activities. Got no problem with that. As OP has said, they're more than happy to, to pay for, for certain things here. But when you're getting an itemized bill, including something that's worth $6.50. Like how petty is that? That is just insane. You can't be dealing with that. And you've got to be rethinking this friendship. Seriously, that's mad. 
Now for our next entitled people story. Now this has actually been in the news recently, a crazy, crazy post. Women involved in the theft of Lady Gaga's dogs sued the singer for not giving her deserved reward for returning them. Her case was just thrown out of court. Lady Gaga owns three French bulldogs. While she was touring in Europe, she had an employee take care of them. While he was out walking the dogs one night, two men jumped out of a car and tried to take the dogs. During a struggle, Gaga's dog walker was shot in the chest, causing permanent injuries, including partial loss of a lung. Gaga posted on Instagram offering a $500,000 reward, no questions asked, for the return of the dogs. Not for the apprehension of the criminals to punish the attempted murder, just the return of the dogs. This distinction is relevant. Three men, James, Jalen, and Lafayette, were arrested and charged with a list of felonies. Jalen's father is Harold. Harold was dating Jennifer. After seeing the reward offer, Jalen gave the dogs to Jennifer, who took them to the police station, turned them in, and asked for the reward. At first, no connection to the crime was made, but eventually it was determined that her boyfriend's son stole the dogs and gave them to her to collect the reward. She eventually pled guilty to receiving stolen property and received two years of felony probation. But she then demanded that Gaga pay her the $500,000 as per her oral contract. When Gaga refused, Jennifer sued for breach of contract, fraud by false promise, and fraud by misrepresentation, asking for the $500,000 plus 15 million on top of that for financial damages, pain and suffering, mental anguish, and loss of enjoyment of life, plus legal fees. Wow. Her claim is that she would not have returned the dogs if not for the promised reward, and therefore was defrauded because she ended up with no dogs to keep or to sell this is unclear, and no reward. Wow, what a lovely person. She wouldn't have returned the dogs if not for the promised reward. Just admitting you'd steal the dogs then, you clown. The judge ultimately dismissed her lawsuit with prejudice, which means she cannot attempt to file it again. Jennifer said she didn't know about the plan to steal the dogs ahead of time, but as the judge pointed out, she never claimed to not know the dogs were stolen by her boyfriend's son when she received them or when she turned them in. Notably, she never alleges that she was unaware that the bulldogs had been stolen after they were stolen or at the time that she received them. That is a direct quote. Wow, what an interesting story. To be honest, I'd forgotten really about the, the Lady Gaga dog fiasco and the fact that you know, the dog walker almost died. I mean, that would have been absolutely awful. But this woman, <laughs> the audacity once again to do this is just insane. Like, why, if you're gonna have a go and try and get this money, why would you not say that you didn't know that the dogs were stolen? Because by not saying that, surely you're just kind of welcoming or encouraging people, the police, really, to to have a look at your situation and say, hmm, I wonder who you're related to and may they have stolen the dogs? Oh, oh yes, they have. What a surprise. Apart from the fact I'm not surprised at all. I mean, look, clearly this entire family are just disgraceful humans. It's, it's mad that this many people in one family are this horrible. But yeah, stealing dogs in the first place, I mean, one of the worst things you can possibly do. And then saying, you know, I wouldn't have even given them back if it wasn't for the reward. Well, yeah, you're just a horrible person, aren't you? Simple as that. More like entitled family rather than entitled people here. And now for our final entitled people story of this episode. Someone in my old neighborhood wants a free house. I found a letter in the mailbox when my wife and I listed our house last year. I have redacted identifying info. Hey neighbor, I hope this letter finds you well and in good spirits. I write this confident that it will find its way to someone willing to help me fulfill a very lofty goal. Over the years, I've longed to live in and raise my children and grandchildren in a safe, friendly, energetic, peaceful, clean neighborhood with good schools. I often pondered what it was like to live on the other side of the tracks, literally. On my way home from work, I'd veer off through the neighborhoods and imagine having a home here in this thriving neighborhood. It was always the trees for me. I earnestly believed that one day I'd make it happen, but unfortunately, I haven't. I've worked my tail off and managed my way through many, many obstacles, but I haven't hit that pinnacle. I do well for myself and live a well-rounded, happy life, and I'm uber grateful for what I have. I just don't think I'll ever be able to afford a home in this neighborhood on one income, especially with the market the way it is and no end in sight, unless something marvelous happens. Therefore, I am reaching out to the community to find out if there is anyone out there that would like to donate a home to me or sell me one at a ridiculously low sale price. I know, the audacity, 
but there are those with abundance looking to bless someone. I see it every day. I even participate where I can. I promise to be a good neighbor and to love it and appreciate it for the rest of my life. I realize this is a radical idea, but who knows what's out there? Someone that has way more than enough and would love to pass their home on to someone that simply asked, has two and is ready to move to their warm weather home and doesn't need to turn a profit. Someone that's just plain sick of humans and is going off grid. Someone that just wants to pay it forward or could write it off. Someone that bought a fixer upper and life changed. I'm very handy. I'm getting older though. Or someone that just hit the Powerball and is leaving everything behind. Maybe you know someone with a home elsewhere. In a community just as lovable, well, please do pass the letter on. You never know. So here I am, asking. My dad always said, a closed mouth don't get fed. I'm currently renting in Redacted and I love it with the constant increase in rent that may not last much longer. I've worked for Redacted for almost 20 years. Well, when I started passing out this letter, I did. Unfortunately, I was part of their layoffs this week. I've attended a women's group in the area for 15 years as well. All reasons that I've intentionally left my name out of this. I'm hoping to save face for now. I made an email for responses to this letter. Please, no hurtful or hateful messages. I've seen the nasty comments on the forums and I assure you that I am a good person with a good heart and good intentions. I'll provide you with my full name, address, references, background check, no resale contract, you name it should you find interest in my request. Otherwise, thank you for simply reading my letter. So long for now. Turns out there are roughly 15,000 homes in this area, so I have a lot of work to do. Serious inquiries only, and then they've put the email address. You know what? I'm gonna give a, a controversial opinion here. I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. In fact, I quite like it. Uh, and I know the voice that I used there when, when you know, narrating this was a little bit, little bit silly, a little bit entitled as, as I tend to do. But genuinely, what's wrong with this? It's not harming anybody. This person shot their shot, and I say fair play. Who knows? If they have the time and the money and the effort level to, to print out a piece of paper with these words on and put it in the letterbox of 15,000 homes, then fair play. Maybe they'll get lucky. Who knows? I mean, what are the chances? You might find someone, I mean, sad, sad though it may be, an elderly person that is on their way, uh, for want of a better saying, has no family. I mean, this is quite sad, actually, but go with me on this. Has no, has no family to really let, let their house to. And they just say, you know what? Yeah, sure. Have it. And what do we do? We work all our lives to be able to buy lovely houses in lovely neighborhoods. If you can circumvent that and shortcut that by doing this, I say power to you, my friend. You know, this is the sort of sideways thinking outside the box that has amazing results. Now, that being said, it, it probably won't. Let's be honest. But if it, if there's a 1% chance that this comes off, even if there's a 0.1% chance, what are you really losing apart from a little bit of time? You're not, you're not losing your face, as you said, because no one knows who you are. Personally, I love it. I don't even think it's that entitled. I think it's just a fair request. I know a lot of you guys in the comments will disagree with me. I hold my hands up. It's a unpopular opinion, but I really rate it. It seems almost entrepreneurial. Uh, it's, it's clever thinking. I quite like it. My mother-in-law photoshopped my husband's nose on our wedding pictures. How do I tell him? I am a 27 year old woman and I've been with my husband who is 29 for seven years. I remember that early in our relationship, one of the first things he expressed insecurity about was his nose, specifically about its width. He never wanted surgery, but he thinks that his nose is too big for his face. I never thought that true and for a long time, I wondered where he'd gotten that idea from. Then I met his mother and all my doubts went out the window. I don't hate her, but the woman complains about everything and she seems particularly interested in criticizing her sons. Barely anything about my husband or his older brother is good enough for her. And if it is, she is quick to imply they don't deserve it. According to my brother-in-law, that behavior didn't start until my father-in-law passed about eight years ago. So they don't usually hold it against her. But to me, it seems like she legitimately doesn't want her children to be happy. Most times that we talk to her, my husband ends up devastated. She constantly complains about me, his job, our apartment, and his appearance. She has, on more than one occasion, suggested that he get a nose job. That tends to upset him, so I always try to shut that down as quickly as possible. We got married in early May, 
The photos were ready about two months later and we created a shared album on Google Photos for our friends and family, including of course, my mother-in-law. I got pregnant during our honeymoon. Can't recommend Dubrovnik enough. And I'm now 24 weeks along. We've had problems with my mother-in-law concerning my pregnancy. We're having a boy and she had a breakdown because she wanted a girl that forced us to put her on an info diet. That was two months ago and she has since improved her behavior. Because of that, we said yes when she invited us to go to a mall near her place to shop for baby clothes last Saturday. My husband had an emergency at work and ended up not coming, but we still managed to have a good time. When we were done, she invited me back to her place. I hadn't been there in a while and I quickly saw that she'd gotten some of our wedding pictures up on the wall. I instantly noticed something was wrong with them, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was yet. My mother-in-law saw what I was looking at and proudly announced that she'd gotten someone to fix his nose. In other words, she gave her son a Photoshop nose job on his wedding pictures. I could not believe it. I never thought she'd stoop so low. It wasn't even a good nose job. It was so bad that my husband's face didn't look real. He looked like a Ken doll and not in the hot Ryan Gosling way. My mother-in-law must have seen how mad I got because she instantly tried to defend herself. She tried to make the point that her son deserved to look his best on his wedding day and I should have convinced him to get the real nose job before our ceremony. I made up an excuse to leave, but I could tell she knew the real reason. She's been calling and texting me almost every day since. I've been ignoring her, but she's always either apologizing, accusing me of overreacting, or begging me not to tell my husband. I know it seems trivial, but I am outraged. And the more I think about it, the more disgusted I get. I could never imagine doing something like that to my child. I haven't told my husband yet, mostly because we've both been busy with work this week, but also because I have no idea how to. His mother was finally starting to be a better person around him and his brother, and I know it will break his heart to find out about this. I don't know what to do. I have to tell him, but I can't figure out how. I know he loves his mother, and I don't want to damage whatever relationship they still have. My mother-in-law also mentioned she intended to send the improved pictures to some of her relatives, so I've got to find a way to shut that down. So, how can I tell my husband that his mother photoshopped his face on our wedding pictures? More importantly, what would be the most peaceful way to do it? Wow, what a start to the episode. I mean, that is just an unbelievable story. I've never heard anything like this. That is incredible. Now, I will say off the bat, it's very sad that your father passed away. And I completely understand why, OP, your husband and his brother have kind of given their mum a pass for a number of years. Because, you know, a death in the family like that is completely tragic. And it, and it could and, you know, probably would lead to some unexpected and strange behaviour. However, it has now been eight years and she's still being horribly and horrifically abusive this is insane i mean the fact of the matter is you have to tell him and there's not going to be a piece of way of doing it you have to tell him the facts he deserves to know yes you don't want him to fall out with his mum, but if someone is doing this to your husband i don't care who it is it's literally incredible like that is mad you've got to tell him he's not going to like it who knows what the repercussions and consequences might be but that's for him and you and you know his mum to deal with absolutely unbelievable i've never heard of anything like this just incredible <laughs> guys comment down below what do you think op and her husband should do in regard to the picture the pictures and also just his mum in general for me i'd say you're not allowed to have those pictures up it's disgusting either you have the real pictures up or I'm not going to talk to you again. And I understand it's easy for me to say as this is not my mum and it's not my family, but I'd be very tempted to, to put that sort of ultimatum in place. Once again, what a start to the episode. Unbelievable. Let's carry on. Now for our next Entitled Parents story. Entitled Dad called the police on me for sitting in a pool. This just happened today and I'm so mad. I am a 28-year-old man and I'm autistic and I just wanted to spend some time relaxing in our local swimming pool. I had black goggles and I like to swim underwater. I also like to simply rest against the poolside and chill. Also, I was the only adult male without any children in this pool, which is clearly for everyone to use. Shallow at one end, deep at the other, etc. I'm just resting by the poolside when a manager, not even a lifeguard, a manager comes over to me and tells me my presence and behavior is making someone uncomfortable. 
He explained that somebody had complained that me diving underwater and simply sitting by the side of the pool was apparently unacceptable because I was apparently doing this to peep on children. He told me this in a non-accusatory tone and seemed to sound as confused as me about this. Okay, well, that's good at least. At first, I thought I was upsetting some overworried parent and being a parent myself, I felt horrible. I explained that I was just relaxing by the poolside. I offered to take off my goggles to put them at ease and I even wanted to apologize to this person. The manager seemed to accept this and presumably went back to the parent to let them know I was sorry for upsetting them. About 10 minutes passed and the manager was back, telling me the police had arrived. I was shocked and asked if it was about me. The manager said yes and that they wanted to talk to me. This is when I meet the entitled dad for the first time. Big guy, maybe early to mid 30s and pretty buff looking. This is the only time he spoke to me and all he said was, you better go quietly or I'll tell everyone here you're a pedophile he walked away before i could reply and the manager led me out the pool i felt tempted to flip this kevin the bird as i walked by but i kept my cool and just left i get to the locker rooms and two policewomen were waiting fortunately for me they were really nice and friendly with me the whole time after grabbing a towel they started asking me what happened and what i was doing i was honest and told them i was just trying to relax and had no idea that i was upsetting this person just by being there I even told them I was autistic, which led to one of the officers telling me they had a family member who was also autistic. They then asked me for my details to run me through their database. While that went on, the entitled dad walked by and one of the officers asked to talk with him. He agreed and they went elsewhere. I got changed back into my clothes and as I was coming out of the changing room, the entitled dad was in my way with his back to me. I couldn't quite hear what he was saying over the other people in the room, but I did hear him rather loudly order his kids to stay put while he went to get changed. He walked off without seeing me and I left the locker room. The police stayed with me in the lobby until their database came back. Of course, it came back that I had no history of crime and the gym staff had told the officers that I had no history of disturbing other people and I was free to go. However, the entitled dad was hanging around near the back of the lobby watching me. The police saw this too and offered to give me a ride home since I'd walked to the gym. I accepted since I was pretty shell-shocked by the whole ordeal and I was worried that this guy would try something on my way home. In all, this was a really scary experience and I'm still shaking typing this. I'm just glad the manager and the police were professional enough to let me speak my piece. I should mention there were other parents in the pool who didn't care about my presence. Another dad and his kids were playing right next to me and he didn't care. Now, good news on this one is that we do have an update. I went back to the gym today to see if the same manager was on duty. Thankfully, he was, and he took me aside to explain his perspective on things. I'll call him Mike. Apparently, that Kevin seemed to be trouble from the start, being very irate with Mike as well as other staff members. The only reason it wasn't the lifeguards dealing with him was because they were scared of him. Being 17, 18 years old, this guy was an early 30s looking buff man. Even Mike, roughly the same age as the Kevin, was concerned with his behavior thinking if he got near me, we'd end up throwing hands. When Mike first told him that I'd offered to leave my goggles off so I wouldn't dive underwater, that apparently wasn't good enough. Then when the police arrived, Mike had actually just told them he was concerned for my safety. Nothing about the pedo accusation. No wonder they were so nice. I then asked Mike if at any point he thought I really was a threat to the kids. He laughed and said no saying that when I'd mentioned I had kids of my own, the fact that I'd offered to apologize and attempt to de-escalate things, he could tell I wasn't dangerous. He was thinking more about me being safe than whether or not I was a threat, and the police seemed to think that way too. At one point after I left, the Kevin got mouthy again, and a receptionist chewed him out for his actions. I wish I could have seen that. Then Mike asked if I'd made it home okay, and I told him about the police giving me a ride. Their car wasn't inside the building. He was relieved and hoped that this event hadn't put me off coming back. I do plan to come back to this gym now since I can count on the staff to have my back. But yeah, everything is cool now and everybody knows what an idiot that guy is. So I don't think I'm in any further trouble anymore. Oh, and to answer why I left, I was given the choice as to whether to go or not. Nobody actually told me to leave. I was planning on leaving a few minutes before this encounter anyway, so I didn't mind too much. It was only when the police officer caught the Kevin staring at me that they offered to give me a ride. Okay, so let's be completely honest here. Realistically, this man is wasting police time, right? OP has not committed a crime or been anywhere near to commit a crime. What they're doing is completely within in the rules of, of not just society, but also, you know, the pool and the gym. And yet he's had the police called on him. 
if that's not wasting police time, I don't really know what is. There's not even a, a semblance of a crime going on here. He's just swimming in a pool. Simple as that. Like, he's not being creepy either. It's, it's not as if he's like going really deep underwater and going up to kids and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. But he probably I hope he's not doing that. Let's just say that. He's not doing that. Let's be, let's be honest. So there's just no need. I mean, I really hope he's not doing that. Can I just make that abundantly clear? Because if he is, that changes everything. But from everything that I've garnered from this story, he's not doing that. Um, and he seems like a normal guy, just chilling out. And he's got kids of his own. It seems unlikely that he was doing anything crazy. But uh, you never know. Um, but yes, in all seriousness, this this guy, this Kevin, has wasted police time and he deserves to be punished for it. To be completely honest, though, yeah, I I'm not surprised that you're shaken up by this. Like, to just be going about your normal day and then have the police called on you for no reason. That is going to shake you up. You're going to be scared. Because you're thinking to yourself, wow, am I, have I acted incorrectly? Am I doing something illegal? But like, you're going to have these questions. It's going to shake you up, even if what you're doing was completely normal and fine and what you tend to do as it as it was yeah i don't really think you should blame yourself for that or think oh why am i shaken up by this that that would shake me up as well scary stuff it's just a good thing that the that the police and the manager were on your side and didn't jump to conclusions now for our third entitled parent story two kids unzipped my cat's carrier and were reaching inside to pet my cats this happened a few months ago when i took my cat to a cat show for those who don't know much about cat shows, when they aren't being judged, they hang out in large pop-up kennels. It's normal for parents to bring their kids to the cat shows, but this cat show had so many kids running around, it was insane. I've never seen so many kids at a cat show. I have nothing against bringing your children to cat shows, just please stay with them and teach them to respect the cat's personal space. So anyways, my cat was sleeping inside a little cat cave inside of his large pop-up kennel. I went to go to the bathroom, and when I came back, Two children had unzipped the kennel and one was petting my cat. Why would anyone ever open a pet carrier and touch a random cat they don't know? I would have never done that as a child. I don't know where their mum was, but the girl was saying that my cat wanted attention and that's why she unzipped it. But he was still inside his little cat cave that was inside of the pop-up kennel. They're lucky I have a ragdoll cat. Extremely chilled, cuddly, social and known as the puppy of cats. Additionally, my cat volunteers with kids once a week walks on a leash, and vibes with literally everyone. But I cannot describe how upset this made me. I want to add that I've never had any issues with kids at any other cat shows but this one. But another thing is that when I was taking my cat to be judged, a kid touched his tail, and I had a couple of other kids try to ask to pet him as I was taking him to be judged another time. To be honest, I think that's all right personally, just jumping in here. But I understand the previous bit, that is not okay. Also, I had to fuss at some kids who went to another person's pop-up cat carrier and had their hands and faces pressed against the mesh to see the cat inside because that's probably very intimidating for the cat. I want to say once again that I've never had issues with kids at other cat shows. I don't know what happened at this one, but for some reason, there were so many kids. I would like to add finally that most kids did have parents with them and were behaving well. Okay, an interesting story here. Just to explain what I was saying earlier, I feel like if a kid asks you at a convention like this, where you know there are going to be, you know, families around and, and lots of animals, if they explicitly ask you, can I pet your cat? I think that's okay. If you want to say no, if you want to say yes, completely fine, up to you. But if they ask you and then you give them permission or not, I think that's fine and that's polite and that's to be expected. But if they just go up randomly to a <laughs> pop-up kennel, unzip it and then unzip another compartment as well inside it and then pet a sleeping cat yeah that's not on and i know they're kids but i mean i agree with you i wouldn't have done that when i was a child and, and nor would the majority of people that is entitled and their parents should be having work